Come on, you go. Hey, yes. How are you? Everybody ready to go? Good morning. So the commission meets today all day long. Uh, <laughs> Yay. Um, back to school. Um, <clears throat> so the commission meets today uh, to discuss the NRC staff review and recommendations regarding expedited transfer of spent nuclear fuel from pools into dry storage casks at reactors. Over the last few decades, the NRC has examined the risk of potential spent fuel pool fires from severe accidents. This issue is important because the spent fuel pools contain a significant cesium source term and don't have the benefit of containment structures. Although spent fuel becomes significantly cooler after the first few months of discharge into the pool, there's still a period of, of time when it may be vulnerable to potential self-ignition generation of hydrogen and significant release of cesium if the cooling water were lost in the pool. Now the physics of self-ignition during a drain down event is very complicated and the arrangement of the hottest fuel in the pools in the racks is one factor in this uh, event, potential event. Now after 9-11 in particular many organizations uh, and the public have raised concerns about the vulnerability of spent fuel pools to uh, fires and terrorist attacks and now after Fukushima concerns have been rekindled again. The staff has recently completed a consequence study based on the spent fuel pool at the Peach Bottom reactor and in addition a more recent regulatory analysis that analyzes the need for expedited transfer of all spent fuel from U.S. pools into dry casks. Not all fuel but of a certain age. The staff has delivered a paper to the Commission that recommends that expedited transfer is not warranted and that the NRC does need, needs not pursue any further generic assessments in this area. So the Commission today is interested in hearing from the staff on the findings of their consequent study and expedited transfer analysis for all spent fuel pools. In addition, we're also interested in hearing from uh, external uh, groups and we're going to hear today from both industry and non-governmental organizations as well. So let me first say that um, I'm going to ask each of you panelists to keep your remarks to I believe 10 minutes. We have a great deal to talk about today so please pay attention to the timing lights in front of you and I ask you also to uh, try to avoid using acronyms. Um, to the extent possible. We'll allow NRC. <laughs> but uh, the public is, is, you know, watching this and we want to make this as accessible as possible. So what we'll do is we'll have our first panel and then we'll have a short break and then we'll, we'll hear from the staff. Okay. Let me first ask my fellow commissioners if anybody has any comments they'd like to make. No? All right. Then with that, I'm going to turn to the first panelist. We have Mr. David Heacock, who is President and Chief Nuclear Officer of Dominion Nuclear. Thank you, Chairman Paul. I appreciate it. And Commissioners, Happy New Year. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to express the position of the industry here this morning. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the NRC staff has performed a very thorough, conservative analysis to determine whether it makes sense to remove the older or used fuel from the spent fuel pools or not. Uh, since the older fuel represents a small fraction of the heat load and a small fraction of the gaseous off-site dose consequence activity, it just makes perfect sense that the conclusion would be it makes no sense to remove this fuel from the pools at this time. Next slide, please. The um, 
in the case of all these 21 spent fuel pools that were studied by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff, they all experienced seismic events that were greater than their uh, design basis earthquakes. Um, in the case of North Ann, I worked at that plant for 25 years, very familiar with the design of the plant and the spent fuel pool. And it just so happens I've been to all these facilities that have all 21 of these spent fuel pools in the last uh, few months. I visited Kasurazaki, Karawa, Fukushima, Daiichi, and Daini in September. That was my second time back to Daiichi and Daini. And uh, you can see from Daini specifically that they had essentially the same earthquake that Daiichi had. Daiichi had the hydrogen explosion. It's more difficult to determine what caused what, whether it was a hydrogen explosion, seismic event, tsunami, et cetera. Daini's a little clearer. When you go look at that, you can kind of discern what was tsunami, what was seismic event, no hydrogen explosions, obviously. So you see uh, almost no seismic damage at Daini. Uh, Onagawa is actually closer to the epicenter, and the pools there survive with no issue whatsoever. There was some sloshing, minor amounts of water lost. So this is all very consistent with what we saw in the study that was done. No significant damage. At North End, the same thing was true. The uh, August 23, 2011 earthquake, there was no safety-related structural damage. There was some cosmetic concrete spalling, some ceiling tiles falling, those kind of things. But we had an earthquake that was about twice the peak ground acceleration of the design basis earthquake in North Anna, right here in Virginia, August 23rd of 2011. And the spent fuel pool did not slosh, did not lose any water, did not lose cooling. There was really no consequence at all in that event. Uh, next slide, please. I thought I'd include this for a little bit of context. Some photographs here of uh, Kiwani, North Anna spent fuel pools, as well as the dry cast storage facility for used fuel at Kiwani. Uh, kind of the point I want to make here is you can see, particularly in the Kiwani picture, really how small a pool this is. This is a single unit site, but the fuel assemblies are essentially the same dimension as a full size reactor. So the, the left and right horizontal dimensions are the same, but it's only for one unit. And you can also see the individual stain on the wall there to get an idea of how robust these facilities are. It's about a three foot thick concrete steel reinforced structure that supports the spent fuel pool lined with a stainless steel liner. And the NRC spent a lot of attention on what happens to the concrete and what happens to the liner. And uh, this is just kind of a way to put it in perspective for you. Uh, the pools are about 40 feet deep. The uh, other thing to note here is that for Kiwani, we're in the process of going from an operating unit to a shutdown unit and placing the unit in safe store. As a result of that, we've done some of the same calculations that the NRC did in their consequence analysis for our Kiwani plant. It got essentially the same results. So our calculations agree very closely. We saw the same conservatisms that the NRC saw. I'll discuss in just a minute here. Next slide, please. Fukushima Daiichi, Unit 4, is an example of how robust these spent fuel pools are. This was the fourth largest earthquake ever recorded in history. Uh, the building was damaged extensively by a hydrogen explosion as well. And as I pointed out, it's hard to say which, what's what. You can see that Daini, you can't see that Daiichi because they were so close in proximity time-wise to one another. But the pool structure, operating deck, and all are essentially still intact. And the pool lost very little inventory, although there was a lot of concern over it, did not really lose inventory. Next slide, please. The analysis that was done for Peach Bottom assumed an earthquake about six times their safe shutdown earthquake magnitude, a very, very large size earthquake. So there's a conservatism to begin with that the earthquake chosen was very large. Even with that large earthquake that was chosen, which was larger than Fukushima Daiichi experience, for example, the fourth largest earthquake in history. Uh, so this would have been a third largest earthquake in history that was analyzed in this particular analysis here. Even with that, it's a very small probability of pool leakage. In order to get that, the staff assumed the fragility or the ability for the liner to tear was more so than it actually was. They used carbon steel instead of austenitic stainless steel. Austenitic stainless steel is much more resistant to tearing than carbon steel. And they used some other conservatisms in that analysis. So they ended up with um, assuming a small probability of leakage and calculated that in the consequences here. Next slide, please. Um, you know, we, we saw earlier at least 21 spent fuel pools have seen a seismic event more severe than their design basis earthquake to date with really no significant consequences. And as the chairman pointed out, there's been numerous studies over the last several decades, and they all really have the same conclusion, that the spent fuel pools are really not a significant source of off-site dose or consequence. Um, for example, in the high-density case and low-density case, if you want to look at those two cases, for the high-density case, there's a four and a half orders of magnitude of margin 
between what was calculated and the safety goals set by the NRC. On the high density case, it was, on the low density case, it was five orders of magnitude. So it's a half a order of magnitude difference between these two cases, both of which well or well conserved are much more safe than the safety requirements require. Approximately 100,000 times safer than the goal. Next slide, please. Uh, today, all the plants in the United States have procedures to deal with loss of spent fuel pool inventory. We've always had procedures to do that. As a result of the September 11, 2001 attacks in the United States, the security-related orders require additional safety measures to be taken. We put in place additional equipment and procedures to deal with that. Uh, and the study takes credit for those. What the study does not take credit for is now we have the flexible, diverse equipment required as a result of the Fukushima plant a Fukushima uh, accident at all of our facilities. We also have procedures in place to deal with this, and equipment still coming on site. For example, Dominion sites, we have equipment at all the sites today to deal with that issue. Um, we're also going to have regional support centers. The Memphis Center is already established. The Phoenix Center will be established by this uh, first half of this year. In addition to that, there's 62 other sites available to borrow equipment from to provide water. The bottom line is that uh, this is not a complicated mitigation, nor is it difficult. It's simply just add water. That's what the consequence is. That's what the, the compensatory mitigation is. Next slide, please. The NRC staff, and correctly so, used multiple layers of conservatism in their analysis. Each layer was designed to favor expedited fuel offload. Uh, even with all those conservatisms added in the favorability added to it, it didn't really result in any change here. Um, very conservative analysis were used, as I mentioned earlier, for spent fuel pool liner fragility or how easily the liner would tear. A uh, very large earthquake was used. In the high density case, mitigation was assumed. In other words, you could go in and add water easily or spray the pool down. In the low density case, mitigation was assumed to not be successful. That assumption alone adds a factor of 19 to the case difference. That's a big difference there. Next slide, please. I mentioned over the decades there's been numerous studies that have, have analyzed the spent fuel pools, existing high density configurations, and all determined that they'd be extremely safe with considerable margin to the, to the requirements, to the safety goals. Um, we, all, we have seen a number of cases where the seismic event has exceeded the capacity designed into spent fuel pools, and we found during the North Manor earthquake there's tremendous conservatisms even in the codes used. I'll give you a quick example. One of the non-safety buildings that houses our station blackout diesel at North Anna, we put that earthquake into the design basis code for the building, and it said the building would collapse because of the conservatisms in the design code. Now, the building did not collapse. It actually had zero damage to it. So the design codes have significant margins built directly into them. Now, this isn't an accident analysis code. This is design code. They're not, not intended to analyze accidents that occur or events that occur. It's easy to get off track and focus on the consequences of these events without looking at the probabilities. The probabilities are very, very important in this case. We're seeing numbers like one in 10 billion per year, one in a trillion per beer per, per year. These kind of numbers, engineers have a hard time saying this, but they're effectively zero. When you get that many zeros in front of a decimal point, it's effectively zero. One in a trillion is a very, very small number. Madam Chairman, that concludes my remarks. 30 seconds to spare. Thank you. I like it. Good. Keeping us on time here. That's great. All right. Next up, we have Christine King, who's director of uh, the nuclear and fuel chemistry activities at the Electric Power Research Institute. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, not only about the expedited transfer, but what we're doing at EPRI uh, in terms of research around spent fuel pool or spent fuel management. Um, next slide, please. A necessary and important task associated with the operation of the nuclear power plant is the management of spent fuel. It has become necessary to transfer spent fuel from the pools to dry storage. At this time, fuel is transferred from the pool to dry storage at a pace to keep up with to support refueling operations for the reactors. Accelerating this pace requires a multifaceted evaluation um, and has been evaluated by multiple organizations. 
There are numer fa numerous factors to be evaluated and balanced as a decision is reached whether expedited transfer from the pool to dry storage improves the safe storage of nuclear spent fuel. Not only has EPRI evaluated the expedited transfer and spent fuel, but today I'd also like to talk to you about what we're doing in our current and future research programs. Next slide, please. The EPRI study models representative plants as well as looking at an industry-wide impact of acceleration. It's difficult to determine what factors should dominate a decision associated with acceleration. Assuming a particular spent fuel pool or spent fuel inventory for the fleet, we did evaluate how accelerated transfer would impact operations, drive the potential need for design changes in the casks and or the isfices, I'm sorry, independent spent fuel storage installations, um, and the spent fuel inventory in the pool, and how that changes the decay heat and the cesium-137 inventory in the pool. However, our study does not address uh, how to maintain off-site dose at its current limits if you're going to load shorter cooled fuel. We did not address additional inventory from new plants even though we realize that's a likely reality here in the United States. And we did not attempt to quantify the risk associated with the increased fuel handling activities. Um, so what we looked at is a base case and the base case is basically the pace at which we're transferring spent fuel from the pool today to dry storage. And then we looked at a 10-year case starting in 2015 and a 15-year case starting in 2015 as well. We did not attempt to optimize the timing here. We didn't look to see how fast could it be done. We just evaluated a couple scenarios to see what the impacts would be. Um, along with some of the other assumptions made, uh, we did have to uh, assume what the spent fuel discharges would be, how high would the burn up be. Um, we did look at the dry storage requirements and the technology and whether using existing technology you short load or whether we could, in, in the timing of each case, whether we could license new canister designs and have uh, work with the higher heat load fuel that would be expected. We looked at the available time, um, whether it was a single unit site or a multiple unit site. What is the available time to actually load new casks and the associated worker dose with that? And we looked at the cost for construction of additional casks and the increased shielding inside the cask. We did not look at any modifications to the actual pad or changes to the site boundaries because of uh, increased dose out in the dry storage. Next slide, please. So our study indicates that you can get a large reduction in the inventory in the spent fuel pool up to 75%. This is coupled with a reduction in the cesium-137 source term up to 53%. However, accelerating the transfer only provides for at most a 32% reduction in the decay heat for the pool. Um, to achieve these results, it does require loading additional canisters, uh, upwards of 100 canisters uh, above our, what we're doing today. Um, it, it did involve increased worker dose, and as I mentioned before, a potential change in the public dose. Um, EPRI has completed other studies associated with this issue. For example, um, we recently have published a risk framework for the spent fuel pool and piloted that on a BWR plant. We've evaluated the Fukushima Unit 4 spent fuel pool following the tsunami and earthquake, <laughs> and we continue to follow the NRC's research on spent fuel pool fires. The cost associated with doing expedited transfer by our estimates is an additional $3.5 billion to the industry. Um, if you were to break that down to one particular plant, um, you're looking on the order of 20 to $30 million to affect the expedited transfer. Um, next slide, please. Given the DOE's current strategy for storage of uh, used nuclear fuel, extended storage of spent fuel at plant sites will be necessary until the plants are decommissioned. Our experience with aging management of the operating plant leads us to proactively plan for aging 
degradation of the dry storage systems to ensure that we fill any technology or knowledge gaps prior to any indication of degradation. EPRI's program is focused on understanding the fundamental behavior of fun fuel cladding as it cools, the management of the dry storage systems themselves, and ensuring that we develop the data necessary to support transportation after long-term storage. We've worked with our extended storage collaboration program, uh, which has, uh, is an open program with regulators, international regulators, uh, research organizations from across the globe to develop um, a research gap list and prioritize that. As such, one of the highest priority gaps we had was uh, associated with high burn-up fuel cladding properties, and we recently initiated a full-scale demonstration project with the DOE to study how the high burn-up fuel cladding responds to long-term storage, which eventually um, Dave here is going to nicely host at North Anna. Uh, we expect the project to take about 10 years to complete but it should provide the industry the necessary confirmatory data to support storage and transportation of high burn up fuel. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, there are numerous factors that need to be evaluated and balanced relative to a decision on expedited fuel transfer from the pool to dry storage. And whether this improves to the safe storage of nuclear spent fuel. EPRI's research will be focused on proactively evaluating the need for aging management of the dry storage systems themselves and preparing for the day when we need to fully load casks with high burn-up fuel since that's what we're discharging from our plants today. And I'd just like to go on record to say I beat you. You have two and a half minutes back. <laughs> All right. Even better. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very informative. All right, we are now going to hear from Dr. Gordon Thompson, who is a research professor at Clark University and the executive director of the Institute for Resource and Security Studies up in Cambridge. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I have this slide. Thank you. Um, my presentation is supported by three declarations that... Uh, I've asked to be distributed to the commissioners that were produced on behalf of a consortium of environmental groups around the United States. But this presentation is strictly my own uh, views. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows a low-density rack. Uh, the NRC staff <coughs> appears to have uh, forgotten what a low-density rack uh, uh, looks like. Uh, these used to be standard. Uh, in my view, it's a reasonably respectable piece of nuclear engineering, uh, passively safe against uh, water loss under most circumstances. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't expect you to read all the detail of this uh, slide on the screen, but um, the point is that the staff has looked at only a small fraction of the possible scenarios that could lead to loss of water in the event of an accident or an attack. And I'll return to probabilities of these events uh, later. So there's a large number of scenarios that are just not addressed at all in staff analysis to date. Next slide, please. This uh, slide shows a situation of partial loss of water from a spent fuel pool, which I describe as the severe reference case. This represents many possible scenarios for loss of water. And for three decades plus, the NRC has refused to systematically study this case. Even though there has been a partial precedent uh, in the PAX-2 accident in Hungary in 2003. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, what I describe as ignition delay time, which is uh, the shortest time required for spent fuel to heat up to the point of zircaloy ignition. Uh, this shows that we're dealing with a relatively slow developing uh, incident uh, for fuel aged 1,000 days, a little over three years. We're looking at 21 hours in the fastest case for heat up. So you might think if the accident is so, or the incident is so slow developing, why should we worry about it? Next slide, please. This gives a hint as to why we might worry about it uh, a great deal. 
This uh, illustrative case shows the on-site contamination due to a reactor release. It's a simplified illustrative case, but in this instant, average over the first day of lethal dose would be accrued in four minutes of exposure, and over the first seven days, within 10 minutes of exposure, suggesting that in this uh, instant and others like it, um, mitigating actions would be precluded if they involved any human action on site. Um, next slide, please. Outcomes, why are we worried? Um, we've had uh, two large actual releases. Uh, in the Chernobyl case, um, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, retrospectively concluded that uh, this release was perhaps the dominant cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and one could extend that to the Warsaw Pact. So dramatic uh, political and social effects. In Fukushima, where we have a fallout of only six petabacarals, there are to this day 160,000 people reportedly uh, displaced, and the entire nuclear fleet is shut down. Looking at potential releases, the NRC uh, has looked at a peach bottom release of 330 petabacarals leading to long-term displacement of 4.1 million people, which I'd submit would be a national disaster. The uh, French agency, IRSN, uh, has attempted to add up all the economic damage from a hypothetical release of 100 petabacarals at the Dampierre facility, and their high case is $8 trillion dollars, which is about half the current U.S. gross domestic product. Next slide, please. Inventory is available for release. Uh, each pool at Peach Bottom, 2,200 petabacarals, twice what's in the Fukushima Unit 4 pool, and a great deal more than the six petabacarals uh, fall out from Japan. Um, and uh, circumstances at Peach Bottom uh, could uh, lead to a release uh, in the range of 2,000 petabacarals, vastly greater than what we experienced at Chernobyl or uh, Fukushima. Next slide, please. Brings us to some broad questions about risk. Um, uh, it's uh, common to say that risk is the product of probability and consequences. Uh, although that's common, it's important to be clear that this is not a scientific statement. It's a statement of ideology. It's a statement of value and has no scientific basis. What should be the indicator of probability? Uh, given the scale of consequences of a very large release of cesium, I believe an appropriate indicator would be the number of occurrences per century across all nuclear facilities in the United States. The probability and consequences uh, could be determined in larger or dominant part by uh, qualitative factors. And that's uh, particularly true of uh, potential attacks. Uh, and having uh, a large amount of uh, uh, cesium position where it can be released by attack uh, I submit actually attracts attack and increases the, the uh, probability. Uh, it's, I think, uh, legitimate to describe uh, spent fuel pools adjacent to operating reactors as uh, pre-emplaced radiological weapons awaiting activation by an enemy of the United States. Final observation uh, is that the staff has for more than three decades focused on rapid and total loss of water from spent fuel pools. Um, this is a reprise of a focus in the 1960s uh, on large break loss of coolant accidents from reactors. And this, uh, in my view, fundamentally warped the design of reactors uh, in terms of containments and uh, safety systems. Next slide, please. Fukushima instant, uh, uh, some people take as a sign of reassurance. I take it as a wake-up uh, call. Next slide, please. Now, reverting to low-density open frame racks, and I'm talking about true low-density open frame racks, uh, not the low-density case considered by the NRC staff. The cost driver is uh, predominantly the transfer cost to transfer fuel from uh, uh, high-density racks to dry casks. 
Now this transfer is going to occur anyway when the reactors are shut down uh, in the absence of a repository or a centralized uh, store. Thus the incremental cost of acting now is simply the time value of the transfer cost. The preceding speaker from EPRI quoted around three and a half billion dollars. Uh, I'd submit that the true cost is substantially less than that. It's whatever the time value is of that cost. Uh, there is an issue of high burn-up fuel which uh, complicates the transfer to dry casks. That's symptomatic of a larger problem with high burn-up fuel that I believe requires attention. Final slide, please. Conclusions. <clears throat> Given the information available, I believe that the uh, commissioners should order the rapid reversion of all pools in the United States to low-density open frame racks. That would require excess spent fuel to be transferred to dry storage. The commissioners should also uh, require the staff to scrap its um, pool fire consequence study and its tier three analysis and send them back to uh, do a really thorough open and science-based inquiry into the phenomena related to uh, pool fires, uh, including risk linkages between pools and reactors. And in the declarations that I've submitted and that I mentioned earlier, I've laid out in some detail what uh, those investigations should cover. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the issue of cask fires uh, should be addressed. And uh, I can explain what I mean by that uh, if necessary. And this inquiry should be internationalized because pool hazards um, exist elsewhere. La Hague in France is a good example where there are four pools uh, positioned so that the mid-height of the fuel is about at grade level and they're licensed to hold almost 18,000 tons of uh, spent fuel. Uh, that's, I think, the largest spent fuel hazard I'm aware of. Hence, an international inquiry would be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. All right, we're still on time here. Okay, Ed. <laughs> Pressure's on Don't you. Don't count on it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, next we're going to hear from Dr. Ed Lyman, who's a senior staff scientist with the Union of Concerned Scientists. All right, thank you and good morning. On behalf of the Union of Concerned Scientists, I'd like to, and we appreciate the opportunity to present our view on this very important issue. UCS has long supported expedited transfer of spent fuel to dry casks as a prudent, passive defense in depth measure that can significantly reduce the risk from accidents and attacks on spent fuel pools. We have reviewed the staff's documentation uh, with an open mind and detail and our conclusion is we don't believe it has provided adequate support for its recommendation that this issue be closed out at this, at this time. We, we personally do not think that more study is needed to make a decision uh, to proceed with expedited transfer but uh, putting that aside, we believe that at a minimum, phase two should proceed because there are many unexplored issues uh, that uh, deserve fuller analysis. This is a substantial safety improvement, and any regulatory scheme that does not indicate that is a defective scheme. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, that was my. <laughs> right. The next slide. The the NRC's responsibility is to protect, uh, protect the health and safety of everyone, not just an average citizen affected by an average accident. So even if the calculations uh, based on averages in most cases suggest action is not warranted, uh, there are still dangers posed by high-risk outliers, and those need to be addressed in order to fulfill NRC's mandate. Next slide, please. The staff uh, there has, have provided significant non-concurrences to the regulatory analysis of in ComSeci 13030, and they raise serious issues with the study's methodology, and we believe the Commission needs to give these objections great weight. We don't think the management response to the non-concurrences adequately addressed the concerns raised by the staff. Next slide, please. Uh, to reiterate uh, uh, what Gordon has just provided, I'd just like to uh, show three numbers. Um, these are a little bit different from what Gordon provided, but uh, the total cesium release from the Fukushima Daiichi accident was in the vicinity of half a megacurie. 
according to the staff spent fuel pool study, the maximum release from a low density pool scenario was less than that, around a third of a megacurie. And the peak release evaluated in the study, which was far from the peak release possible for the high density one by four scenario, was 24.2 megacuries. So simply by going to low density fuel storage, you can almost guarantee that you're capping the consequences of this event of a spent fuel pool fire at something less than what happened in Fukushima, which I would argue is, is pretty bad already. Next slide, please. Uh, three more numbers, again, to provide perspective, is that the uh, UN has estimated about 32,000 person sievert for the collective dose to Japan from Fukushima Daiichi. Again, the spent fuel pool study found for a low density pool with no mitigation, uh, the peak collective dose was less than that, around 27,000. And for the high density one by four, it was more than 10 times more, 350,000 person sievert. Next slide, please. Now, we think that dry casks and transition to low density pool storage are essentially fulfilling uh, the NRC's desire to see more passive uh, safety technologies in the future. If uh, someone came to you and said they had a new spent fuel storage technology that would greatly reduce the potential seizing release from the spent fuel pool fire using highly reliable and less complex shutdown decay heat removal systems using inherent or passive means, using simplified safety systems that reduce required operator actions and designs that minimize the potential for severe accidents and their consequences, you would probably think that was pretty good new design. Well, that's exactly what a transition to uh, dry casks and low density fuel storage could achieve based on the staff's own analyses. So we think that, the, and I, just to uh, remind you, this came from the NRC's advanced reactor policy statement, these principles. Next slide, please. We think the staff used the wrong methodology in trying to evaluate the value of expedited spent fuel transfer. The quantitative health object objectives are not the right metrics to evaluate land contamination events because they focus only on acute uh, exposures to areas very close to the plant. And if your analysis assumes essentially substantial uh, or complete evacuation of that area to begin with, then the qual uh, quantitative health objectives almost by design will not show significant consequences. So they simply are not the right metric to use. The cost-benefit analysis that the staff has uh, used and it's based on the current regulatory analysis guidelines uh, do not give adequate weight to features that are important in a spent fuel pool fire, such as the impacts beyond 50 miles, such as uh, increased reliance on defense and depth uh, to compensate for uncertainties, uh, non or less easily quantifiable aspects of land contamination, and security considerations. Next slide, please. I've, uh, there are many flaws in the regulatory analysis and the spent fuel pool study that we've identified, but I'll just point out a few of them. The regulatory baseline in the study assumes that spent fuel is immediately offloaded into a one by four configuration and that the pool has full core offload capability. Both of these assumptions provide a substantial additional uh, benefit in the event of a uh, spent fuel pool loss of water, which may not be reflective of the actual state of the fleet. Uh, more on that later. The regulatory analysis is a patchwork of different studies. There was no comprehensive evaluation of pressurized water reactor pools as there was in the uh, spent fuel pool study. And so two thirds of the fleet has not been considered on a consistent basis with boiling water reactors. These numbers were pulled out of older studies and it makes it very hard for the public to understand that uh, if the different numbers are done on a consistent basis. Also, the studies assume evacuations of up to 30 miles and sheltering actions ordered between 30 and 40 miles for high density scenarios and only 10 miles for the low density, low release scenarios. This is well beyond the APZ regulatory requirement. I would argue that sways the analysis in a non-conservative fashion toward high density pools. I'd like to see the analysis with that assumption relaxed. Next slide, please. I don't think I have time to go through these, but a 72-hour analysis limit 
is unrealistic in light of the situation that we saw at Fukushima, where there was argument for many more days than that over whether uh, it was even necessary or appropriate to add water to that pool. So I would disagree with uh, Mr. Heacock's position that that was a no-brainer um, event. It was a lot more complex than uh, he's giving credit for. Um, many of these issues were examined in a very limited way in the sensitivity analyses and the regulatory analysis, but it does not specify how you deal with, um, with different results when the cost-benefit analysis shows that there's a positive benefit in certain sensitivity analyses. The staff just uh, brushes that aside. We have not, the this, this study has not adequately accounted for uncertainties. In the state-of-the-art reactor consequences analysis, the independent uh, peer review panel and the advisory committee on reactor safeguards both said you need an uncertainty analysis. And I think I have uh, that document here. It's a it's a thick document analyzing the uncertainties and the kind of consequence analysis that the staff has done without uh, that analysis for the spent fuel pool study. There needs to be a comprehensive uncertainty analysis to make sure that you are adequately addressing the full range of events. Next slide, please. Defense and... Um, okay. Mitigation. Um, one word in mitigation is that the study claims that 50-54 AH2 measures, that is otherwise known as B5B, were uh, assumed. But if you actually look at what the study did, it assumed that there was a miraculous expansion in the capabilities of those B5B measures. Uh, so what the study actually assumes is something closer to the f uh, fully implemented FLEX program than B5B. Um, also, the assumption that successful mitigation only applies for low-density pools, I've looked at the calculations. It appears it would affect the answer by 10 percent or less, which would not make a very big difference. And the reason for that is that the consequences of low-density uh, accidents are so much lower already that that additional factor of 20 would not make a big difference in the outcome. Uh, next slide, please. I'm running out of time. Uh, security is also a consideration for defense in depth. I'm afraid I don't have time for these. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but the NRC has not, cannot affirm that one by four configurations are actually achieved or how long it takes for them to be achieved after refueling. So the, again, the baseline of the study does not reflect what the public can understand the state of the fleet is. Next slide, please. I'll skip that. Next slide, please. One other aspect, hydrogen mitigation. It should be clear from these analyses that only high-density scenarios produce sufficient hydrogen for an explosion, that avoidance of hydrogen explosions has many benefits in addition to mitigating uh, the consequences, but also for reducing occupational hazards from multi-unit accident risk, site cleanup, and decommissioning. Next slide, please. So finally, we think that a new framework needs to be implemented to fully understand the benefits of expedite spent fuel pool storage and that any decision should be deferred until that new framework is in place. Thank you for your time and I apologize for going over. Great. Now we can move on to questions. Thank you all very much for your presentations. Uh, and I think we look forward to a robust Q&A session right now. We'll start off with Commissioner Savinicki. Thank you. Uh, welcome to all of you, and thank you for each of your presentations this morning. Um, as someone who yesterday was reviewing some transcripts of previous commission meetings on related topics, uh, I'm going to begin with a correction that I, th I think is needed, and I apologize if I didn't hear this right, but Mr. Heacock, I think on your slide nine, when you talked about the cases where mitigation was assumed effective and not effective, I think you actually flip-flopped the cases here. I think your slide number nine is correct. It says mitigation only effective in low density cases. It was assumed not in high density. I think when you stated it, you said that. the opposite. I, I'm not, I don't know if we have the capability to read back, and I'm not going to take our time with that, but I, I just, again, as a student That's last night of reading say. some transcripts, it is, it's hard if you, if you don't get that corrected, because then it, it's thank not you. certain when you're just reading it years later. So um, thank you, but I just wanted to get that on the record. And then... Um, 
Ms. King, you talked about um, research on transportation after long-term storage. I find that a very um, interesting topic. Could you talk a little bit about what are the parameters that are planned to be studied in, um, on that topic? Well, I think the most important thing we want to look at and what we're looking forward to in the high burn-up demonstration is the integration. We've done a lot of separate effects studies on high burn-up uh, fuel. And by loading a cask fully, we can see what the integration is and whether there's any um, cumulative effects when you have a cask fully loaded with high burn-up fuel. Relative to the cladding, what we're looking at is um, ensuring that we have the proper structural integrity such that it can survive transportation and any other handling activities that might be necessary either in a consolidated storage facility or in a geological disposal facility if we're going to be doing any repacking. Um, so given the uncertainty around final disposal for spent nuclear fuel, it's important that we understand um, in long-term storage, what is the expected integrity of the, of the cladding itself? Because you would handle damaged fuel differently than you would handle intact cladding. And so um, is the basic phenomenologies of concern there have to do with materials and structural? Is that in, yes. a, in a succinct way? Yes, it would way be material based. studies around hydride reorientation um, and how how that happens as the fuel cools. Okay. And when you talk about uh, long-term storage, what kind of time frames are your analysts uh, suggesting? Um, I, I think at a minimum we're looking until the plants are completely decommissioning long-term storage at plant site. We're, we're planning uh, that it would be within the, the confines of the independent spent nuclear fuel facilities we have today. Um, in dry storage. Um, so probably 100 years, you know, if you're to bracket the fleet. And in the um, body of research that you've talked about, either conducted or planned, uh, that you described in your presentation this morning, uh, has, does EPRI work uh, collaboratively with the international community? And are you um, familiar or have you done work in looking at not just operating experience, but how spent fuel pool hazards are uh, evaluated or treated in other um, kind of other inter international research institutions or other peer bodies that you might coordinate with? Well, definitely through our extended storage collaboration program, we have uh, a broad reach out in terms of um, what the needs are for dry storage. Um, in previous years, we've done a lot of work associated looking at um, the safe storage within pools. Um, I guess there, there has been a fair amount of risk work, but that's outside of my area really to comment on, but I could, I could get back to you with a more complete answer. Okay, thank you. Um, for the cases in the NRC staff's analysis where mitigation was assumed to be effective or effective to some degree, um, it was interesting to, to hear the uh, presentation just now that um, the staff assumed more of a quasi-flex or near to a full flex capability as opposed to a B5B capability. Mr. Hecock, do you have any reaction to that? I think the comment was based on things like the fuel availability for the security order. There's a time limit you had to have fuel available for. With flex, that time is 72 hours, and you have the ability to refuel from off-site. So essentially, it's indefinite with flex. So there's no reason to truncate the study for the flex approach. So um, I think Dr. Lyman was correct in that the assumption may have been longer than the 12 hours assumed in B5B. But in your presentation, you had talked about flex giving sites capabilities beyond what was assumed in the NRC staff's analysis for the mitigated cases. Would that be uh, from, from standpoints other than the specific case you just mentioned? Uh, no. And with the flex, there's additional redundancy, for example. We have additional equipment. We have additional abilities to deliver water to the spent fuel pools that was not available with the original security order. And um, one other point 
that I would uh, like to see if you have any reaction to was the, um, I believe it was Dr. Thompson who mentioned that the costs associated with movement to uh, dry cast storage should be considered uh, more of an acceleration in time of a, of a cost that will or is likely uh, to eventually occur in the United States given the lack of progress on the uh, final disposal location. Would you, um, Mr. Heacock or maybe um, Ms. King, do you have reactions to that statement? Uh, I think Christine summed it up correctly. There is, it's, it's not simply a time value theory of money issue. If you have to offload the fuel pools earlier, the fuel is hotter and requires fewer fuel assemblies to be put in each cask. You have to short load the casks. It also has off-site dose consequences that are higher. So it's not simply a time value theory. It's actual additional cost with Christine summarized in her presentation. That's the true cost of accelerating the, uh, the offload. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. All right, on to Commissioner Postlakis. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm having a problem, and maybe Dr. Lyman and Dr. Thompson can help me with that. The staff says it's not worth it. The advisory committee of the Act of Safeguard says we agree. The statistical evidence says that these pools are very robust. M minor damage here and there under very strong earthquakes. Why would I go against the staff's recommendation with this evidence? Can you give me the top one or two reasons why I should do that? And I, uh, let me make another comment. These studies should not be reviewed as academic papers, where you can make all sorts of comments about details here and there. You should have studied this, you should have done study that. It's a regulatory decision we are making here, and you have to give me a reason that would upset that decision, not something that will make the study better. So if you can give me that, I'm very willing to listen top one or two reasons why the decision is flawed. Dr. Thompson? I'll give you the top reason, and uh, this is only one, so uh, it's not the only reason. Um, in the declarations that I've provided, uh, I've shown evidence that uh, spent fuel pools and reactors are vulnerable to attack. Uh, obviously, I have not given detail on that. That would be improper. Uh, however, if you look at those declarations carefully, uh, I believe you'll conclude that um, an attack uh, achieving a spent fuel pool fire is within the capability of non-state actors. The probability of this event uh, is numerically indeterminate, but uh, I submit that it is significant. And we have had attacks on the United States, uh, as, as you know. Uh, the consequences of uh, a successful attack could be extremely severe. Uh, a release of 85 pet petabacrils of cesium in the opinion of uh, the leader of the Soviet Union, led to the disappearance of that political entity. The fallout of six petabacarols has shut down the entire nuclear industry of Japan, among other effects. And uh, I'm talking about uh, potential release exceeding 2,000 petabacarols. So your main point is the security issue? You asked me for my yes. top. My top, your top thing. So it's the That's security it. that we, yeah, and yeah. that was not discussed. Dr. Lyman? Well, I'd just like to take issue with your statement about academic studies compared to regulatory analysis. No, it's not a peer reviewed academic study, but I think it's the Commission's obligation that their decision making be made on, uh, with regard to sound science. And if there are, there are flaws in the regulatory analysis, 
uh, it would be a mistake to determine to make any decisions until those have been fully vetted. And given the staff non-concurrences and some of the issues that I've raised, I think those flaws uh, really would rate uh, a, a poor grade for the study for making a decision. That's why we urge you to go on to the next level. Uh, just uh, taking the ACRS opinion, for example, I haven't seen their letter yet, but in the case of the state-of-the-art reactor consequence assessment, as I said, uh, the ACRS reviewed that study very critically, you may remember that, and one of the objections was that it was taking a snapshot, uh, what they called best estimate was pulled out of the air based on some <coughs> mythical judgment, there was no comprehensive sensitivity or uncertainty analysis. The ACRS and the independent peer review said you need to do an uncertainty analysis, and so the staff took a couple of years and produced this. One consequence of the uncertainty analysis, you may remember in the Sorca study, the staff trumpeted the fact that there were zero acute fatalities. Uh, that was one of the main talking points they presented to the public. Well, in the uncertainty analysis, they find out that's not true anymore. There are many, there are many scenarios where there are acute fatalities. So I would submit that until that uncertainty analysis is done, you are not having, you don't have the full range of information to make this decision. So the uncertainty analysis is the flaw. It's uh, one I still flaw. disagree. We are not reviewing these this as academic papers. You have to tell me what will make me change the decision. What is the driver? And you are saying it's the uncertainty, the lack of uncertainty analysis, which is a legitimate uh, complaint. Um, a lot of your arguments really are based on the consequences of a release. And Mr. Uh, Dr. Thompson, you make this interesting statement, which I have to challenge. What are the ideologies that tells us that we have to multiply probability by consequences? Is it a Marxist? Is it capitalist? Is it, what is it? <clears throat> or is it just mathematics? Um, I've discussed this issue at some length uh, in my most recent declaration that, that uh, has been provided to you, uh, and uh, I don't have the time to spend upon all of that, but the um, first question is whether you fully understand uh, the probability and consequences, and I submit that there are many reasons why you don't when you don't understand the full magnitude and scope of the probability or the consequences when you're talking about events such as those we describe. And then there's the question, even if you did understand it, um, why is it uh, appropriate to multiply these numbers, assuming that you can even provide numbers, and produce some very low combined number and say that this is acceptable. Uh, that, that is not a scientific statement. It's an arithmetic statement. Um, but uh, a, a well-informed um, citizen in sound mind could simply say, I reject that. If the consequences are predicted to exceed a certain level, I find that intolerable, regardless of what the probability may be. So when I say uh, ideology, I'm, I'm not talking about Marxism or capitalism. I'm talking about this um, presumption that um, we, even if that we can find numbers and multiply them together, and somehow this makes a dramatic outcome acceptable. Yeah, uh, I think it's a little related to what Dr. Lyman said, that we should look at the higher percentiles to make a decision because of the consequences. But surely you agree that if the probability is extremely low, like meteorite hit, the consequences, yeah, they may be large, but I mean, that has been a philosophical issue. You know, if, you, if the consequences destroy the world, would you still go with the probabilities? I, I don't want to get into that because I don't think we are we're in this uh, thing. And one other question for you, Dr. Thompson. You have submitted uh, your statements and so on, and there was a detailed response uh, by uh, uh, 
Dr. Powers of the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards. Have you read that? Uh, yes. I, w I would like, please, to respond briefly to a statement you just made about media impact. Uh, that's a force of nature. Media impact or a volcano or whatever is a force of nature. Here we're talking about uh, machinery made to produce electricity. Uncertainties, because we did it. Yeah, I agree and with that. a, a human-made machine that provides electricity is not anything remotely like a meteor. Uh, there are many ways of making electricity. So you are really saying that the probabilities are not on a sound footing. I mean, that we produce them or the staff produce them, there may be uncertainties or, la or there are uncertainties and so on. But can you give me a quick response because I'm running out of time. Have you read uh, Dr. Powers' commentary and do you agree or disagree with that? Um, well, I've responded in my most recent declaration to his commentary. So oh, so there's a written response? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to... I have many more questions, Madam Chairman, but... We can have another round. Don't worry. Okay. Commissioner Magwood. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> well, good morning and uh, Happy New Year to all of you. I haven't seen all of you since uh, 2013. Um, uh, first, I, I wanted to... Um, uh, I see Bob Alvarez sitting in the back back there. I haven't seen Bob in more than a decade. You look good, Bob. Um, <laughs> and uh, Bob and I used to work here at the Department of Energy, and it's uh, you know, a pleasure to see you still engaged in these issues. And I, I did see your memo on high burn-up fuel, um, and I'll make a point to pass it off to our research staff to make sure there's nothing in there that they've missed. So I appreciate you uh, putting that, that list of issues together. Um, yeah, obviously, this is a an issue that many people have been engaged in, this issue of spent fuel expedited transfer. Um, I've heard from um, a variety of people in a variety of communities about this issue. Um, it's one that for some people is a very emotional issue because they think it's obvious that uh, this that the dry cast storage is safer inherently than, than pool storage and therefore why won't we just do that? And I think that um, the study, while um, it certainly, you know, isn't unassailable. Does provide some interesting um, new information, which I think is is worth reflecting on. And for me, one one thing that was kind of an interesting aha moment, and I talked to staff about this quite a bit, was the um, analysis showing that the presence of the cooler fuel in conjunction with the harder fuel and the one by eight configuration particularly um, act as a, as a heat sink and, and actually mitigate it, the probability of a spent fuel fire. And that's something that really hadn't come up before. So while, while the, you know, there is some criticism of the study, I think there is some, uh, some new facts that, that really have not been discussed before. And I, I, I won't, don't want to dwell on the details of the study, but I think it's, that was one thing I wanted to highlight because I thought it was very important. Uh, but when I think about this matter overall, and I listen to the conversation at the table this morning, it sounds to me that um, one issue that is at the core of a lot of the concerns is this issue of mitigation. And I, 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 I certainly hear from sort of the deep Hecox side of the table that um, this is easy. We put water in the fuel pole. We're going to deal with this. And more from uh, what well, I think I hear from Dr. Thompson and, and from uh, Dr. Lyman is, well, you know, it may not be that easy. And I wanted to I wanted to sort of start with that, and maybe start with um, with Dr. Thompson because you presented a chart that um, I think, in fact, in your declaration, you you highlight there's a line that you have that says that. We have ample evidence that water makeup and other mitigating actions could be precluded for a period substantially exceeding 20 hours. And I was going to ask you what you meant by that, and then I saw your slide, and I realized what you meant by that is that you think that the consequences of a reactor accident um, could lead to an environment um, which I think you characterize as, as high as f uh, 44 sieverts per hour. Wasn't that the number in your chart, I think? What, what, what kind of reactor accident is that, and what kind of scenario is that where you would see that kind of, what kind of radiation field? Um, the case I presented in my 
uh, slide is described in its uh, footnotes. Um, uh, and I explained to Commissioner Apostolakis that my top concern is attack. Um, and I can think of a variety of attack scenarios that would produce a local radiation field of that nature. Uh, an accident um, uh, would have to be a severe accident uh, with a substantial loss of containment in order to achieve a similar radiation field, but that's also possible. Okay, well, I, don't, I don't think it's anything. We don't think we've seen anything like that. Even I don't even think in Chernobyl those kinds of radiation fields were in existence at, at the plant site, were they? Um, we we didn't see it at Fukushima, fortunately. The the um, but the local radiation fields uh, are still intense, uh, and they're precluding personal access to the the immediate vicinity of the reactors to this day. Um, but fortunately, the scenario I described did not play out. At, at uh, Chernobyl, um, the uh, nature of the explosion threw the material very high into the atmosphere. Um, so although there were fatalities in uh, responders, um, the radiation fields didn't, in that instance, reach the sort of levels I'm talking about. You're correct on that. Um, let me ask uh, Mr. Heacock to talk about that because the mitigation is is the, this the entire theory behind flex is the whole uh, basis really of the staff's um, conclusion. I think that, uh, that that no more needs to be done because of the ability to deal with um, a wide range of um, spent fuel pool scenarios. Um, can, can you react to uh, to this, and, and, and particularly in the case of, say, you have a joint reactor and spent fuel incident? Yes, thank you. A uh, couple things I'll point out here is currently all the reactors, their spent fuel pools have alarms very close to the surface of the of the level of the pool. So we get alarm in the control room that the level is dropping very quickly. In addition, as you know, the orders from Fukushima require a new and, and more thorough measure of level in the spent fuel pools, and all the reactors I'm aware of have chosen radar, which will tell you the exact level of the entire elevation between the pool, the fuel, and the top of the pool. So you have a very fine view of the pool water level and a decay rate. Uh, the partial drain down scenario Dr. Thompson talked about earlier is a very slow evolving event, and you have a lot of time to react to that. The analysis shows you'll be plenty of time to put the water back in the spent fuel pool. There are install, installed mechanisms to do that in addition to B5B and flex mechanism to do that. And what happens if you have a high radiation environment? Uh, if you had a high radiation environment, because more difficult, the NRC did, a, did evaluate the no mitigation scenarios to see what that would look like for cooling. Air cooling becomes very important, even in the scenario with a partial drain down. Air cooling is still very significant, and Dr. Powers points that out in his response, that that can provide adequate cooling for a very long period of time. It doesn't mean that access is entirely precluded either. The, one of the mechanisms we use for delivering water is a spray system. So that spray system could be activated without getting up on the pool deck to do it. For example, okay. um, it's always frustrating. We have a complicated subject in ten minutes to talk about it. But let me just, in the few minutes we have left, let me just ask the whole panel for very brief comments. When when you think about the particular narrow issue of the spent fuel pool um, safety, um, what do you? All of you have mentioned Fukushima at least in passing. What, what is the lesson of Fukushima? When you look, when you saw at Fukushima, what do you walk away with um, in this issue? And just ask, just ask these all, each of you for a brief comment. It's not the spent fuel pools. I'm not concerned about that from a Fukushima perspective. Which is you worried about the station blackout? That's, it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a Dominion issue. I just want to point that out here. <laughs> the rest of the lights are still on. Um, it's not a spent fuel pool issue. As we know, we had concerns about that, but that was not the concern that drove the accident. It was training, location of the reactor facility, and backup or flex type equipment. Ms. King. I think relative to Fukushima, we spent, uh, we did a detailed analysis of what happened with the hydrogen explosion. I think what we learned is that there is uh, coping time and that the spent fuel pools are quite robust. Uh, Dr. Thompson. Um, Fukushima was a product of bad regulation, bad reactor design, and it's a wake up call. Yeah. Well, in this context, just focusing on, on this. Pool number four, 
uh, as you know, there was significant uncertainty during many days after the accident, and the question of what would be the appropriate mitigation was, was a, uh, there was a lot of argument about it. I would submit that, e that there are circumstances, even with a different type of pool uh, event, where there would be, uh, it would be unclear what the appropriate mitigation strategy would be. Uh, for instance, if there were a risk, if, if the, uh, there were a partial drain down, uh, it's not clear uh, whether you would want to restore water in the pool or not, uh, because uh, there's a possibility it might make it worse. Uh, in other words, do you want to let all the water drain out of the pool rapidly and count on air uh, cooling, uh, but do you understand the thermal hydraulics well enough to make that call under uncertainty? I mean, there are a lot of studies uh, the, the NRC has done. These are heavily redacted, but it's, it's, it's not that simple. The, the um, it sounds like then you would you're supportive of the sorts of measures we've taken, the orders that were put out um, after Fukushima to enhance the fuel pool instrumentation. That that sounds consistent with your concerns. Yes, and we we've supported that order, but again, it's the implementation of the order, like with the other orders, that uh, that could lead to some concerns down the road. Yeah, and I'm sure you'll be watching us on that as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Commissioner Ostendorf. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for your presentations. Uh, I think hearing different perspectives from different viewpoints is extraordinarily helpful to the Commission. Let me start out with Mr. Heacock and Ms. King, if I can, uh, just on one specific point. Uh, there have been some criticisms of the NRC uh, in recent months or in the, maybe the last two years on the accuracy of some of the cost estimate uh, data that our staff has used in looking at what it takes for industry to accomplish a given function. Do you have any comments on the cost estimate approach used by the staff in the spent fuel pool paper? In this case, the, the industry did not really have an issue with the cost used. It's fairly well known what the costs are of loading dry casks. And, uh, Comparing that to the minor safety improvement, I think, was the, the real comparison. So we really had no issue with that in this case. I would agree. Um. Okay. Uh, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Lyman, any comments on the cost piece? Because that's been something that the cost of war, not specific to this issue, but there been, have been some criticisms of the agency in that area. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I think there are many areas where the kind of cost analysis that's done for regulatory analysis can be uh, subject to question. And, and if you go into the innards of MAX-2, which is used from everything from SAM analysis to the study, you see that there are many parameters that uh, uh, have an important impact on the conclusions yet have not been revised substantially since uh, for decades. Uh, for instance, the decontamination cost. That's a very critical part of the study, by the way, is the uh, balance between land values and decontamination costs. You could change the, the outcome of any calculation depending on how those are measured. And uh, you may be familiar with the uh, recent decision where the challenge was made to particular parameters um, based on the fact that they came from a sample problem that was provided with the MAX-2 code 30 years ago um, and have still been, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, have been used without reconsidering them carefully. And that, that's the kind of thing, uh, you know, if, if those parameters have an important impact on the outcome, they need to be understood a lot better. Thank you. Could I just supplement? Sure. Um, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation, the French government agency, IRSN, uh, has done an economic damage uh, study for a release at the Dampier site. And I commend that to your attention. Uh, I'd recommend that the Commission translate that from the French into the English and have it widely studied. It's the most comprehensive cost, consequence cost assessment of which I'm aware. Thank you. Let me shift to, uh, well, I'm going to make a couple of comments here. And I guess I'm going to, uh, piggyback to a certain extent on my uh, colleague, Commissioner Apostolakis's questions that uh, approach the, this panel with our responsibilities as a regulator and uh, the difference between a regulatory approach in, in some cases and in instances and a uh, perhaps a more academic approach. 
I would comment that it's important for us as a regulator to adhere to our principles of good regulation, uh, predictability and stability of regulatory processes is a very essential element of that. And in that light, our staff, I believe, this is my personal opinion only, I'm not speaking for the rest of the Commission, obviously, here. I think the staff has done a very credible job in reflecting Commission policy in its application of the Quantitative Health Objectives, QHO, analysis in this paper. And I realize that Dr. Thompson and Dr. Lyman may have different approaches that they think might be preferable, and I respect that difference of opinion. But with respect to our staff's implementation and application of the QHO uh, approach, do you have any concerns or disagreements with how that approach was executed by our staff in this paper? Dr. Thompson? Um. I have uh, recommended uh, in my presentation that two documents by the staff be scrapped. That's the consequence study and the tier three analysis. Uh, I have not studied either of those documents in excruciating detail. Uh, I've studied them enough to know that uh, they have uh, what I consider severe and incapacitating deficiencies. Well, well those, those are pretty strong statements you're making, Doctor. I just ask if there are specific inaccuracies or errors in how our staff has applied the Commission policy to use the QHOs, I think we'd want to hear that. Dr. Lyman, do you have any response to that? Uh, yes, I do think I mentioned in my uh, talk that the QHOs, again, are, are focused on either latent cancer fatalities within 10 miles of uh, a release site or acute fatalities within one mile. Now, the if a study actually assumes that there is a full, complete, and effective, timely evacuation of those regions, then almost by fiat, you're going to get uh, low risks within those areas. So the question is, do, uh, does that application make sense? And that's the larger question. Well, if you're my question though is whether the, they've applied it well, correctly. The, the, you're not, the question is, in the application of our QHOs, that's the constraint right. of the question. Well, what I, errors you see and how the staff has applied the commission? I would policy. say that you need to uh, you need to have a defensible uncertainty analysis so that you understand the range of probabilities and consequences so that you can apply them uh, uh, comparatively. And I don't think that's that's been done here. All right, let me shift over to another piece. And I I'm assuming that Dr. Thompson, Dr. Lyman, you, I'm assuming your information on the security slash terrorist uh, threat is based on information that's publicly available. Is that, is that a fair statement? Uh, in my case, that is correct. I have, do not and ha never have had any security clearance. Okay. I bring that up because I think you're at a little bit of a disadvantage here, and I think because this is a public meeting, but a lot of people watch these, and there's, as Commissioner Svenicky noted, there's a public transcript that becomes available. Uh, I feel an obligation to at least make a comment on that because you're at a disadvantage here and it's not, not something that I can correct nor that the Commission can necessarily correct, but Dr. Thompson, several times you made comments about your top concern is attack. This, these are radiological weapons referring to spent fuel pools and, uh, quote, vulnerable to attack, and I appreciate your comments. I feel the need as a commissioner here with a public meeting to state that I respectfully disagree with your statement of the concern on terrorist attack because your statement leads one to believe that there are no precautions being taken from a physical security perspective. And again, you're not uh, read into these programs and I respect that you, you have, uh, there's a significant body of knowledge you're not uh, able to access. I would just tell you that uh, I personally have been around nuclear reactors, nuclear weapons since 1976. I've carried nuclear weapons on numerous Navy ships I've been assigned to and been around uh, security res responsibilities in the National Security Administration. And I think there's a significant body of uh, protection that's classified that does provide very robust physical protection for the spent fuel pools, which are part of the protected area at our licensees. And so I, I just mention that because I think if it does not, is not said at this session, then the public's left with the impression that the Commission 
perhaps by silence is acquiescing to some of the statements, which I understand why you're making that. You just don't have the access to the information to have a more fulsome perspective. So I thought it important to make that statement on the record. Could I comment? Uh, sure. Uh, everything I've said and will say is based on public information, but I have had the opportunity. Uh, I have uh, clear safeguards clearance, and I have the opportunity to see at least circa 2005 or 2006 uh, some safeguards information related to physical protection. So, uh, and that does inform my overall view as well. Um, but the point uh, I want to make, which is in. Uh, I raised it, I don't have time to really discuss it, is the Commission does not disclose the, the, what the configuration of the pool is at discharge, how long it takes if there are licensees that cannot achieve a one point, uh, times four configuration, um, or it, it doesn't tell how long it takes until that's achieved, but it does say there's a significant increased risk until you do get to one by four, and we don't, the public doesn't know how long that is. Uh, so we just have to take the Commission's word that there's adequate protection for that in increased risk until then. Now, if you were to transition to low-density pool, one of my slides shows that there's a very significant benefit compared to a uniform configuration. And so you wouldn't have to um, hide that information anymore. The public could have more confidence that even right after refueling, you don't have an enhanced risk of release, and so that in the event that uh, there is a security uh, event that is not successfully mitigated, that there's another defense in depth measure to prevent uh, the kind of large scale uh, catastrophe that the numbers in the, in the pool study find for uniform uh, high density pools. So, um, so I think that argument itself. Uh, you can enhance public confidence without disclosing safeguards information if you don't need to hide that number anymore, how long it takes to get to a one by four, or even if there are licensees that can't achieve it at all. Thank, thank, thank you for the comment. I'm out of time here. Did you have a quick 15-second comment? Uh, this is a device for producing electricity. There are many possible devices that can perform that function. In this particular case, uh, the public uh, is told that um, this particular risk is dealt with somehow, but they can't be told how. That's a cost associated with this particular machine for producing electricity. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Okay. I know everybody has lots of questions, so we can go around again. Um, I know I have lots of questions. So, uh, and with all due respect to Commissioner Ostendorf, I, I think that um, uh, for completeness of, of study, if you are going to consider precursors to an event at a spent fuel pool, one should consider all potential precursors. And if terrorism is one, that should be considered, of course, with all the understandings of the security that exists at, at reactors and et cetera. That, but that should be part of the analysis. Um, so uh, a quick question, and, and to, to just uh, on these, the question of the, the quantified health objectives for everybody, just quick go down the line. Um, should the commission use the quantified health objectives as a risk criteria for decisions on spent fuel management in general? Is that appropriate in your view? Uh, yes, I think it is. I'll, I'll, start, I'll start this end. I guess yeah, I'm going to say great. more. Thank you. Uh, I think it is appropriate. The, the uh, staff chose what I believe is the best way of measuring this and compared it against what they've used as standard methodologies in the past for evaluating these type of events. It's an off-site dose consequence. The quantitative health objectives measure that. So I think it's a very good measure of that. Okay. Ms. King? I, I see no issue uh, and, and don't have a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult item to quantify and I, I think, I think it's as good a measure as any we have. Okay. Uh, the consequences could be very severe in terms of uh, public health, environmental damage, and social and political and national level economic costs, and all of those should be considered, and the quantitative health objectives do not do so. I think I've already gone on the record that we don't think it's the right metric for this particular uh, analysis. Okay. Are any of you aware of uh, the practices of other countries in terms of their spent fuel management vis-a-vis -vis pools and dry casks and the reasons that they 
follow the practices that they do? Are any of you aware of any other countries and their practices? Um, <clears throat> in my ob observation of uh, nuclear industry and regulators in a number of countries, uh, they mostly take their lead from the NRC, uh, and that's true of uh, spent fuel hazards, and that's why in my concluding remarks I recommended that uh, any detailed phenomenological study should be internationalized to the mm -hmm. extent possible. Anybody else? Uh, one additional comment. Uh, we're not aware of any other countries. We did look at that issue to see if any other countries had decided to prematurely offload the older spent fuel from the spent fuel pools intentionally into dry cash. Well, I know that actually at least two countries do that. Uh, Sweden and France both Might be offload the size of their pools within or... a year or 18 months. Right. But they go to a centralized pool, so. Yeah, that's a different story. For if it has a centralized reprocessing or a centralized storage facility, it's a different facility. But if it's stored on site, we're not aware of any countries that move off intentionally from wet to dry storage. That's my experience as well. And we're seeing um, more countries implementing dry storage um, to keep pace with the reactor operations. Okay. But I, I do believe, and I just saw one story about this, that France, the regulator, has recently ordered a, a review of uh, spent fuel pool uh, safety oh, in that's France. Interesting. So you might want to look at okay. what, what they're doing. Yeah, I should talk to my friend Pierre Franck. Okay. Um, so let me start with individual questions. So for Mr. Heacock, so we've had some questions here about the practices of, uh, of uh, um, the plants uh, in terms of spent fuel management. So tell us. Is discharge of spent fuel at North Anna into the one by eight configuration as analyzed for, is that how you guys do it? You unload into one by eight? Do you unload into one by four? Um, I don't know the answer to that specifically. It's one by four is where we ultimately end up in. I don't know if it's done that initially or not. We have the ability for at all of our units for full core offload from all the units. That was one of the questions that came up previously. Mm -hmm. And we intentionally configure the pool in advance of refueling outages to minimize the amount of fuel stored together that's hottest. So I think it would be really helpful if industry could provide me and the public with the practices, yeah, what, we'll whether you all maintain full core, full core offload or not, whether you immediately unload into a one by four or one by eight, uh, what are the practices of the industry? It would be nice to get some facts on the table so we're not just sitting here guessing. Um, <clears throat> let me jump to Ms. King. Um, so should new reactors in the future store spent fuel using industry practices from the 1960s and 1970s? Or should we actually do some new thinking here? In terms of whether we should stay in the pool versus dry store? No, in or? terms of whether we should use these high density racks and whether the pools should be sized as they are, uh, you know, whether we should be planning to move fuel out, we should be planning for dry cast storage, should we be thinking ahead, how far should we be thinking ahead, should we be thinking about, you know, some kind of centralized storage? I mean, how should we be approaching this? Should we just do what we've been doing for 50 years or, or actually rethink? Um, I haven't spent much time uh, looking at new plant designs in particular. Uh, I would say that um, so relative to the size of the pools or those types of things, I don't, there may be someone at EPRI that has an opinion. I do not. Uh, I think um, right now we are waiting for an answer on what are we going to do with spent fuel. But in the meantime, the utilities and the industry, we do have a responsibility to evaluate the technology that we have. What we see coming is everyone's discharging high burn-up fuel. And we need to ensure that we understand the properties associated with the cladding and the safe long-term storage of the high burn-up fuel. Um, whether we should do consolidated storage or geological disposal. Um, there's lots of pros and cons on both sides of that. Okay. Let me ask another question. Okay. If expedited transfer was required for fuel greater than seven or ten years of age, twelve years of age instead of five years of age, mm -hmm. would the worker dose be as great? Can you tell me? Did you guys analyze for that? We did not. We did not analyze for that. But Do you have an idea? But 
Obviously, the longer it cools, the, the dose would go down. It's not uh, linear, though. It's not linear. That's right. No, it's not linear. Um, you know, other considerations in working with the shorter cooled fuel is that it's actually thermally hotter. And, you know, mm -hmm. so if we were to work with shorter cooled fuel, we need to go back and look at our fuel handling operations and ensure that our workers are safety for right. Example. But let's let's say that we're not looking at the shorter cooled fuel. Okay. Let's say that we're looking at the. I mean, these pools have a lot of fuel in them, and some right. is very old. Let's say we're talking about some of the really old stuff. And you, would you guys reanalyze for that? Did you and think about analyzing for some of the older, moving some worker doses from the older fuel? You know, what are what what are some of the greatest contributors to worker dose during fuel movement? I don't know the exact answer to that to that particular question. Um, I think relative to contributors to the worker dose in our study, it comes primarily from the need to load additional canisters. So if you're not working with the shorter cooled fuel and therefore not loading additional canisters, I think there is a potential that it could, the worker dose could be lower than what we estimated. Um, we did not we did not try to do any type of iteration or optimization in our study. We ran a couple of cases to understand the impact. Um, okay. It's something that could be looked at, obviously. Okay. Um, all right. Let me move down the line here. So, Gordon, um, you note that uh, the staff doesn't look at partial loss of water that would reduce air cooling in a closed rec. Um, the staff performed, you know, the staff looked at these closed racks. They didn't look at what you had proposed in the, your first slide, which was the open rack. So, you know, the staff has indicated to me that, that recently discharged fuel could still oxidize and self-ignite even with open racks. So, do you agree? And you know, tell me, is the physics really different between open racks and closed racks? <laughs> and how is the physics different? In if the, it is. In the open rack, um, uh, in the event of water loss, there will be three-dimensional vigorous convective circulation of air and steam, uh, providing cooling to the exposed portion of the fuel assemblies. Uh, there could be some instances in which very short cooled fuel would self ignite under those circumstances. And that's one of the issues that uh, could be resolved in the detailed phenomenological study that I have recommended be performed. Uh, but we, we know from um, fairly simple physics that that's, that's a, a transient situation that uh, only the shortest cooled fuel would, would be subject to self-ignition. We don't know precisely what number that would be in terms of days of cooling, and that's why we did the study to find out. Um, if, even if uh, such ignition were to, to occur, uh, the distance between the fuel assemblies would make propagation of that fire to surrounding fuel uh, less likely to occur. And even if propagation did occur and the entire inventory were to catch fire, the amount of cesium uh, in the pool would be substantially less than in the high density case. So you add all of these factors together and it's clear <coughs> that the um, range of circumstances leading to a fire are many fewer than in the high density case and the consequences are limited by the inventory. I guess I'd like to see all of that quantified. All right, um, I'm over my time, way over. Let me uh, <clears throat> see if everybody, anybody has additional questions. Uh, if I could just note that um, in something that's fairly unusual for the Commission, we have actually scheduled 
another meeting this afternoon um, to one I think that we're making up because of the government shutdown that occurred in October. So um, I would just make an appeal that we, if we could conduct this meeting such that we could have a break between these meetings, um, I think it will, I'll speak only for myself, really help with my energy level this afternoon if we can have a break between these two meetings. Thank you. George? Yes, I do. Uh, Ed, your slide three says, even if calculations based on average assumptions suggest action is not warranted, the danger posed by high-risk outliers needs to be addressed. And you also mentioned earlier that uh, there is a lack of uncertainty analysis. So am I to conclude from this that if we did a rigorous uncertainty analysis and looked at the high percentiles, then we would identify some of those outliers? Uh, yes, hopefully that, that would be the, the point to look at those that are important. Now, the staff also did, as you know, a high, medium, and low calculation. You don't like that? I think those uh, were pulled out of thin air. They, they were based on judgment calls about certain What's parameters high? and not based on uh, any kind of meth uh, you know, systematic methodology. And uh, I've, in certain cases, the choices they've made, I think, don't, uh, don't make that much sense. Now, can I conclude from this bullet that maybe not all plants need to expedite the transfer of fuels, but there may be a few? Is that your understanding too? That's not our general position, but um, we do, th there could be site-specific site -specific. Um, aspects the key words which would make it, site -specific. Yeah, Thank you which would make it more warranted. Thanks. So, yeah. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not. But. <laughs> <laughs> really just relatively brief, I think. I, I wanted to just ask uh, Mr. Heacock and Ms. King, um, this, in this TAFS analysis, the one by, eight, one by eight configuration had some safety benefits, and the ACRS pointed out that that's worth some consideration. Although in this in the staff's recommendation, it wasn't enough to um, require regulatory action. Is this something the industry's uh, looking at and thinking about? It? Now, I'm not sure we're looking at it or thinking about it. We currently have a number of analysis done, some of which I can't talk about in here for various ways we configure the spent fuel pool to minimize any risk for loss of cooling. And some of those involve different configurations than 1x4 and 1x8. So there are other alternatives we look at and actually implement today. But I'm not prepared to talk about what the options are going forward. That's not a, a role we typically take in our program with the industry in determining uh, what configurations they're implementing in the pool. We did work with them as the transition was made into uh, high density racks and uh, we focused our attention on the degradation of um, the morale and things and uh, poisons that we're using in, in the pool. So that's a little beyond the scope of what EPRI does uh, with the utilities. Okay. No? Okay. I have a question for Dr. Lyman. Um, all right. So you suggest starting over, or short of starting over, <coughs> let's talk about the a phase two study that you suggest. So should um, the risks of dry cast storage be holistically examined with spent fuel pools? Uh, should we be looking at uh, high burn-up fuel and the capability of storing that and the effects in the pool of that? Should we be waiting for a broader level three PRA analysis to consider severe accidents at reactors and pools? What do you think? I would say yes, yes, and no. Um, uh, I think it's fair to evaluate uh, dry cast storage risk uh, we think that that would add a relatively small additional component uh, compared to the reduction risk from pool fires. There is the issue of adequate protection against sabotage of dry casts. It's a current um, issue being considered by the, by the staff, and we think that uh, there does need to be greater protection for dry casts, but given that, 
uh, we think that we still believe that there would be a significant risk reduction, so uh, that should be added on. Uh, the issues associated with the practical issues associated with expedited transfer and uh, safety issues associated with dry cast storage if I burn up are important considerations and, uh, and we do think they need to be evaluated. As far as waiting for a level three PRA, I don't think that's necessary, but I, I do think um, that uh, there needs to be a more systematic uh, approach to to the spent fuel pi uh, fire issue in particular to look at all the fleet in a consistent manner, including uh, PWRs. Because the, we know that there's been a lot of work on PWRs. We know there have been pool fire experiments with PWRs. We know they're even looking at other phenomena like ballooning or cladding, which they didn't study in the BWR case. Uh, th that work needs to be brought to bear uh, in this analysis. Okay. Okay, that's it for me. That's it for everybody. Okay, then we will take a short break, five minutes, and uh, reconvene.
You guys are way ahead of me here. Okay, you're ready to go. Then let's ha hear from the staff now. So I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Michael Johnson to uh, introduce the rest of the staff and move forward with your, your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, can I have slide two, please? In the next 40 minutes, we'll discuss the results of the staff's analysis and recommendation for the Fukushima Lessons Learned uh, issue on expedited transfer of spent fuel. I want to note it represents substantial work for the staff. It, that work was not done in a vacuum. It was done with consideration of stakeholder input and with extensive interaction with the ACRS. Uh, and also, it was conducted consistent with the agency's processes and practices. For our presentation today, Jennifer Yule, who is the Deputy Director of the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, will provide a background and overview. Brian Sharon, who is the Director of the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, will overview the spent fuel pool study. I'm also joined by several staff members who performed the analysis uh, that we are discussing today, uh, Hussein Ismaili, who is a senior reactor systems engineer in the Office of Research, and Jose Perez, who is a senior technical advisor for civil and structural, uh, will talk about, will highlight the spent fuel study approach and results, and um, Fred Schofer, who is, who is responsible uh, for the regulatory analysis in the Office of Nuclear Re Reactor Regulation, will discuss that aspect. Slide three, please. Before Jennifer begins, I want to note that uh, the effort was brought, even though the effort was broad in depth, uh, we focused really on answering several basic questions. And in our presentation, we'll discuss those answers in detail. Um, and the slide uh, that is up will uh, summarizes the results. Um, the questions are, first, is the storage of fuel in spent fuel pools safe? And the answer is yes. Uh, Fukushima and other operating experience uh, the most recent study, uh, as well as previous studies, all support and do not undermine our conclusion that spent fuel pool storage or storage of spent fuel in pools provides reasonable assurance of adequate protection. And although we didn't consider them in our analyses, the safety results or the safety benefits that came from the March 2012 orders and uh, requests for information uh, further strengthen our confidence in the level of safety provided. Second question, uh, would expedited transfer of fuel uh, to achieve low density storage and spent fuel pools be safer? Uh, the answer is yes, arguably, and we'll explain what we mean by that, uh, but the answer is yes. Uh, but the third question and the more important question is, would the increase in safety as a result of expedited transfer of fuel be significant or substantial? And the answer to that is no. Um, as we'll discuss, the increase in safety would be small compared to the increase considered by the Commission to warrant an added increment in protection above adequate protection. So the increment would be small. Um, said another way, um, the staff believes that the increment of added safety would be small such that additional regulatory action is not warranted. The final question, uh, would the increase likely be justified in light of the added cost? Again, no. Uh, you will hear, as you will hear in the presentation, we conclude based on our analysis uh, that use conservative assumptions that were intended to maximize the benefit of low density storage that the increase in safety would not be just cost justified and the ACRS agrees. With that, um, again, we'll touch on those points as we go through the presentation. I'd like to turn to Jennifer to begin the presentation. Thanks, Mike. First, I want to verify that everyone is on slide number four. Okay. Uh, an important point uh, to keep in mind today as we, as we discuss this topic is that the agency has a long history of studying the issue of spent fuel storage safety. The work began in the 1970s when the need to provide additional storage of fuel beyond the original pool storage capacity was first realized. The staff evaluated the high-density pool storage and, and issued regulatory guidance for its review. The reviews demonstrated that such storage was safe and that on-site storage uh, was allowed through 
license amendment processes. The staff evaluated high density storage as a generic safety issue in the 1980s to evaluate changes in the staff understandings of the events affecting the storage pools. And again in the late 1990s in relation to establishing appropriate requirements for decommissioning phase of plan operations. A series of assessments were then performed following the events of September 11th, uh, and it led to a number of, of changes. One is enhanced capabilities to model spent fuel response to the loss of coolant from the pool, which we took advantage of when performing these analyses. And secondly, regulatory changes involving loading patterns and mitigating strategies that were ultimately codified in 10 CFR 5054HH. Following the Fukushima ac accident, the staff undertook the spent fuel pool study in the Office of Research, and we'll discuss that in more detail later. And then finally, the evaluation of possible regulatory actions. And we had documented this evaluation in COMSECI 130030, which of course was provided to the Commission in November. So slide five, please. So going back to a bit of history, uh, during the events of Fukushima, the staff and external stakeholders raised questions on the safety of spent fuel pools, especially since the spent fuel pools at Fukushima had high density storage. At Fukushima, at Fukushima, excuse me, this issue was more so um, on everyone's mind in the early days of the accident when reliable information about the pool status was not available. And there were several questions raised about the integrity of the spent fuel pools after uh, the hydro ex hydrogen explosion in the Unit 4 reactor building. Although subsequent inspections confirmed that the pools remain intact and that the stored fuel was not damaged, the staff nevertheless proposed uh, an item to be added to the Tier 3 list of Fukushima actions to look at um, any benefit associated with expediting transfer of fuel to the dry casks. In May 2013, the staff decided to complete this assessment to support the waste, in, excuse me, the, the public interactions on the waste confidence decision, although the waste confidence decision did not uh, rely solely on um, the uh, Tier 3 activity. So next slide, oh excuse me, no, the second bullet on this slide. The staff developed a plan involving three phases. Uh, COMSECI 13030 provided the results of the phase one assessment, which is, is to help determine if an additional study should be conducted. If the results of the phase one study justify that we need to do additional work, then phases two and three of the program plan would be conducted to refine those analyses to determine whether or not any regulatory action is warranted. So as we will discuss here today, the phase one assessment is more, of a, more or less a screening evaluation. It used conservative assumptions to bias the results towards proceeding to phase two. We think that we excuse me. We think that more study would show even more strongly that regulatory actions are not needed in this area, and that our, therefore our recommendation is that we close this issue without further actions or research. Slide six, please. Specifically as part of the phase one work, the staff prepared a regulatory analysis of expedited transfer of spent fuel to dry cast storage using our well-established processes. Specifically, those are regulatory, regulatory analysis guidelines that are documented in new reg BR0058. Fred Schofer to my left will be discussing this in more detail later in his presentation. The staff relied on information from, from the past several studies, the October 2013 spent fuel pool study done by the Office of Research as well as operating experience to conduct the analysis. The staff used conservative values in the analysis of several parameters to ensure that design, operational, and other site variations amongst the new and operating reactor fleet were addressed. Although the assessment determined that the proposed alternative did not provide a sufficient safety benefit, the staff took the additional step to do some cost-benefit assessments so that the Commission would have additional information available for their decision-making process. We believe both the safety goal and the cost-benefit assessment support our recommendation that additional study of this issue is not needed. In its recent letter to the Commission, the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards agreed with the staff's recommendation. 
So slide seven, please. This figure here, you'll see throughout the, the rest of the presentation, shows the overall approach and how the staff's activities build upon each other. So as Brian Sharon will discuss, as well as his staff, the spin fuel pool study that's depicted in more or less the yellow or tan section um, is the is included a detailed analysis of what would occur at a particular spent fuel pool or what we call the reference plant under severe seismic under a severe seismic event and use plant specific data to evaluate the potential for the for the pool to be uncovered the fuel to be uncovered and then to determine whether or not that would result in releases from the fuel and if so the consequences in terms of public health and safety so the spent fuel pool included a regulatory analysis for the reference plant um, in, a, in what we call appendix D to the study and that's depicted in the green section on the slide and that used information again from previous studies to address other initiating events and conditions to assess the probabilities and consequences of a release from the spent fuel pool at the reference site. This was necessary because the spent fuel pool study focused only on the extreme seismic event. Using the established guidance for regulatory and backfit analyses, we determined that no additional regulatory action would not be pursued typically and that there was not substantial safety benefit associated with removing older spent fuel from the spent fuel pool for that reference plant. However, it was a reference plant and it did not represent the, the variations across the entire fleet of, spent, of reactors and spent fuel pools. So the regulatory analysis uh, that was provided in the COMSECI and it's depicted in the purple section on the slide broadens the scope yet again to address the whole fleet with various plant and pool designs, various initiating events and other variables to support a generic regulatory analysis of the fleet. Fred Schofer is the staff expert who conducted the study, the regulatory analysis aspect, and we'll discuss this later in his presentation. Uh, I will now turn over the presentation to Brian Sharon and his staff, and they'll talk in more detail about the spent fuel pool study, again, as depicted in the yellow or tan. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, the Office of Research embarked on the spent fuel pool study uh, some time ago uh, following Fukushima. Um, the reason was that uh, we saw that the Commission uh, was receiving a lot of letters uh, from the public, from members of Congress, uh, regarding uh, spent fuel pools and whether or not uh, fuel needed to be expeditiously transferred to dry casks. Um, there were no current studies using uh, current tools that we had that had been validated and the like, and we felt that uh, uh, providing the Commission uh, with a technical study uh, would give them the information uh, that they would need to address a lot of these questions, which we felt uh, you would probably be asked at some point. Uh, so we started the study actually even before it became a Tier 3 uh, issue. Um, when we looked at it, uh, the conclusion was it was too broad to do a full-blown level three type of PRA uh, on the entire subject. Um, what uh, we did is when we looked at PRAs, we saw that the, uh, uh, the primary risk comes from losing coolant to the pool and uncovering the, the fuel. Uh, the events uh, that get you there are seismic, uh, which produce leaks or holes in the pool. Um, I think uh, most PRA studies uh, showed uh, the majority, something around 70, 80 percent of the risk comes from a seismic event. And so we focused on looking at a uh, beyond design basis earth earthquake. Um, it turns out that um, when we, uh, you know, as we went into this, uh, the issue actually became a tier three issue. Um, and so the, uh, the spent fuel pool study actually was now going to be an input into the uh, tier three issue. Uh, again, the approach we used was to use a, uh, we used the BWR, the Mark I reactor. Uh, we chose that primarily because we had just finished the, uh, the SORCA, the state of the art consequence analysis study. Uh, so we had a lot of data. Uh, that was available on the plant as well as the fuel, uh, which helped us in terms of getting started very quickly. 
Again, we picked a severe earthquake, uh, which was the highest contributor, and I'll let Jose talk a little bit about the one that we picked. Um, we used our state-of-the-art uh, computational codes. These are codes that have been validated uh, through a lot of experiments uh, uh, to uh, uh, represent the phenomena associated with uh, uncovering fuel and the uh, heat up and ignition. Um, and we, as we said, we analyzed scenarios that included both successful mitigation techniques as well as no uh, mitigation. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jose to talk a little bit about the structural analysis. Thank you. Event with a frequency of occurrence of one in 60,000 per year. A review of previous studies had indicated to us that damage in terms of water leakage below the top of the storage spent fuel might be possible for a severe earthquake with this frequency. That would be an event, a uh, possibility that would be translated into the calculation of a, of a small probability of leakage. This corresponds to an earthquake with a peak ground acceleration of about 0.7 g, which is about four to six times greater than the peak ground acceleration for the design basis of the power plant. The purpose of the structural analysis was to estimate the location and size of the pool leakage, if any, and its likelihood. We developed a three-dimensional three finite element model of the spent fuel pool and its supports to estimate the resulting liner strains under a combination of the dynamic loads induced by the earthquake and those loads that the pool carry on a permanent basis. The results of the analysis show that there is a high probability of 90% and likely higher that the liner would not tear and that water would not leak from the pool. The study also estimated, conversely, that there is a probability of about 10% that the liner would leak, and also estimated that the leak location, if a leak were to occur, would be at the bottom of the pool, at the junction of the walls with the floors. So a partial drain down was not credible for this pool. Regarding the size of the leak, the analysis estimated two conditions. One condition that corresponded to the tears on the liner spreading along the base of the walls. That was what we call the moderate leak that translated into a drain down of a few hours. The other condition was a condition in which the tears in the liner at the bottom of the walls would be more localized at places in which the liner tears to the walls and the floors. That would, was what we call the small leak, which would correspond to a drain down in times of tens of hours. In addition to this, we also looked at the performance of spent fuel pools in recent earthquakes, severe earthquakes in Japan, for example, the 2007 earthquake that affected the Kashiwazaki nuclear power plant and the earthquake that affected Fukushima and other power plants in that area. The, those two earthquakes combined it affected, more than, affected 20 spent fuel pools, elevated pools, and no leakage was reported for any of those plants from uh, but below the top of the spent fuel, which we think is consistent with our results. I now pass the presentation to Hossein Esmaili, who will talk about the, the rest of the results. Thanks, Jose. Slide 11, please. Uh, this, slide, uh, this slide captures the main results of the spent fuel pool study and intends to show the possibility and the magnitude of a potential radioactive release. Uh, in the slide, the blue boxes represent cases where there is no release or where we don't predict any releases. Uh, as Jose mentioned, and as you can see on the top left box, there is a high probability of the order of 90% that the liner does not leak and we do not expect a release in three days. In fact, it is going to take more than seven days to boil off the water and, and, and uncover the fuel and longer to even get to the point of a release. Now, moving to the right side of the slide on the top, in case there is a liner leakage, which is 10% of the time, we analyze how small and moderate leak scenarios would progress. And during the operating cycle, basic, basically taking into account uh, variations in the decay heat level and hydraulic connectivity between the spent fuel pool and the reactor. And so what we found out was that the radioactive release is possible 
only during 8% of the operating cycle or about after the two months uh, or, 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 uh, or within two months after the fuel was moved to the pool, even if no credit is taken for mitigation. So this is an important point. So 92% of the time the fuel is estimated to be air coolable for at least three days regardless of the size and the loading, whether it's high density or low density configuration. So now I'm going to focus on the early time during the operating cycle. This is shown in the middle of the slides uh, where it is possible to get some release. Now for small leaks, these are the two column of the boxes that you see on the left side of the uh, slide. With mitigation, if mitigation is successful, small leaks do not lead to a release or even uncovery of the fuel because the makeup capacity exceeds the leakage by a factor of two. Without mitigation, small leaks generally lead to a very, very high release. And this is because the leak is slow, the fuel heat up is taking place in a steam environment that leads to steam oxidation, generation of uh, hydrogen, and finally a hydrogen explosion. So what the hydrogen explosion does is that it causes severe damage to the reactor building. So you are losing the reactor building, any uh, natural uh, decontamination processes that may occur. And at the same time, uh, what happens is that once the water level leaches below the base plate of the rack that the air comes in, the air that is coming in, instead of cooling the fuel, it is actually going to get to a very rapid air oxidation because the fuel is already hot, so the air is going to actually aggravate the problem. So we are going to get very, very high releases in this case. Uh, for low density cases, we did not predict any hydrogen combustion. For the moderate leak scenarios, these are the boxes, the two uh, uh, column of boxes that you see on the right side of the slide. If there is mitigation, there is still a possibility of uh, release for both high and low density configuration during the first week because the fuel is hot enough. This is the fuel that has just been moved from the reactor to the pool and there is not sufficient makeup or spray flow. After that time, the mitigation is successful in preventing a release. Without mitigation, uh, the releases are generally smaller than the smaller cases because the reactor building remains intact and uh, there is uh, uh, oxygen, air oxidation is limited. Slide number 12. Uh, for the uh, First bullet, so for the, for the earthquake that we studied, the probability of liner leakage is low. The leak is calculated to occur at the bottom. This results eventually in a complete drain down of the pool. Some people have argued and raised the concern that this is not a limiting case because a complete drain down, uh, the residual water prevents air from com uh, coming into and cooling the, uh, the fuel assemblies. However, uh, we believe that the slow complete drain down, the case that we studied in the spent fuel pool, uh, which had a, uh, is actually more limiting in terms of the magnitude of the release as precisely because of the reasons I just explained in the previous slide. Regarding the second bullet in the spent fuel pool study, the low density referred to a situation where older fuel was removed without re-racking. And our assumption at the time was that the presence of the channel boxes impede any potential or postulated cross flow even in open frames. However, the insights from the spent fuel pool study uh, show that open frame racks, even with channel boxes removed, would not necessarily prevent a radioactive release during these two months. And the way we know this is because, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, you know, for the moderate leak scenario during the first week, it's so hot that even with mitigation, you are going to get some release. And in the, in the um, in the uh, moderately scenarios that, you, yeah, that, that there is enough time that you establish natural circulation, the fuel is still hot that you, that you get a release. So these are the two reasons that we inferred from the uh, spent fuel pool study that the fuel is really hot. After two months, the fuel is air coolable, even in the presence of closed frame racks. So in terms of overall probability and the timing of the radioactive release, there is no uh, difference between the high density and low density. However, the high density is leads to uh, high releases because of zirconium fire propagation to the older assemblies. So finally, regarding the offside consequences, we did not predict any uh, early fatalities because of the nature of the release. This would not generate high acute doses to cause early fatalities and because uh, protective actions would move people out of the way. The individual latent cancer fatalities were also low, and they do not vary much between scenarios with, with different, uh, uh, significantly different releases because offsite protective actions would limit exposures regardless of the magnitude of the release. Slide 13. So finally, the past 
spent fuel pool risk studies have shown that the storage of fuel spent fuel pool in a high density configuration protects public health and safety, the risk is low, and what we found out in this spent fuel pool study is that it's consistent with with uh, earlier research conclusions. In addition, the regulatory analysis has shown that expedited uh, transfer of the spent fuel for this reference plant is not justified. And at this point, I would like to, uh, Fred is going to uh, go a little bit more into that. Thank you. Thank you, Hussain. Uh, slide 14. Jennifer previously introduced this figure and discussed the general approach and how the staff's activities build upon each other to address the issue. Brian and his staff then discussed the scope and details of the spent fuel pool study. I performed the regulatory analysis for the spent fuel pool study reference plant. I used the information contained within the spent fuel pool study and supplemented that information from, with information from prior uh, spent fuel pool studies to include an even more severe earthquake gas drops, loss of power, and loss of coolant inventory events. Dry storage casts and related industry costs are based upon industry estimates documented in Electric Power Research in Institute technical reports. Using the reference plant regulatory analysis as a starting point, I broadened this evaluation to cover the spent fuel pool designs at other U.S. operating reactors. This required the consideration of various plants and pool designs, various initiating events, and other variables to support a generic regulatory analysis in order to determine whether regulatory actions or additional studies of this issue are warranted. Uh, slide 15. I performed the Tier 3 assessment in accordance with established agency practices as described in uh, New Reg brochure 0058 the regulatory analysis guidelines. This includes evaluating against the quantitative health objectives as well as developing estimates of costs and quantified benefits. Using this guidance provides a consistent regulatory basis for decision making. The first step is to perform a safety goal screening evaluation to determine whether a regulatory requirement should be imposed based on the safety goal policy statement. The safety goal policy statement defines two quantitative health objectives, which I use to make this determination. The first is a prompt fatality uh, goal, not to exceed one-tenth of one percent of prompt fatality risk resulting from all other causes within one mile. The second, a lane cancer goal, is not to exceed one-tenth of one percent of the sum of cancer fatality risk resulting from all causes within ten miles. If the evaluation exceeds the safety goal screen, the second step is to perform a cost-benefit analysis. This analysis compares estimates of the net potential benefit against costs between the alternatives considered and a baseline. For this analysis, two alternatives were evaluated. Alternative one, or the regulatory baseline, would continue storage of fuel in high-density pool configurations in compliance with existing regulatory requirements. Alternative two, which is a low density spent fuel storage alternative, would require the expedited transfer of fuel with more than five years decay time to dry cast storage by calendar year 2019. Spent fuel would continue to be stored in low density pool configurations. The regulatory analysis was performed to determine whether additional study of expedited spent fuel transfer is warranted. That is to go on to phase two. Uh, slide 16, please. The safety goal screen showed that there were limited safety benefit in pursuing further study of expedited spent fuel transfer. For a spent fuel pool release, there is no expected early fatalities. Therefore, the first quantitative health objective for prompt fatalities was met. For spent fuel pool release, the conservative lane cancer fatality risk estimate to an average individual within 10 miles of 1 in 66 million is less than 1% of the societal risk goal value. Therefore, the second quantitative health objective was also met. Public health risk 
is relatively insensitive to the magnitude of the release due to the slow accident progression, the nature of the source term, the effective protective actions, and the very low likelihood of the event even occurring. Although the regulatory analysis guidelines would normally allow me to stop the evaluation at this step, I performed supplemental analyses of the costs and benefits of adopting the low-density fuel loading alternative to ascertain if further analyses were warranted. Next slide, please. This slide provides a high-level overview of the cost-benefit analysis. The analysis grouped the fleet of existing and new licensed plants to support consideration of differences in plant arrangement and fuel inventory that significantly affect the results. The spent fuel pool study provided information related to the effects of decreased storage density and information considered generally applicable to boiling water reactors <coughs> that had elevated pools, particularly for the initiating seismic event considered in that study. Past studies, past spent fuel pool studies, provide reasonably conservative frequencies of other initiating events, other than earthquakes, such as cast drops and extended pool boiling scenarios, and provide information regarding relative differences between boiling water reactors and pressurized water reactors spent fuel pool response to those events. The analysis used different values for the amount of radioactive material released to the environment and the probability of successful mitigation to conservatively bias the results in support of expedited transfer. The analysis used represented fuel inventories for the two alternative loading condition with conservatively high release fractions for the high density loading alternative and low release fractions from the spent fuel pool study for the low density loading configuration. Also, the analysis assumed the release frequency of the low density alternative was only 5% of the frequency used for the high density case due to artificial consideration of successful mitigation for the low density case. That is, no credit for a successful mitigation was employed for the high density case. Some of these key Conservatisms are highlighted on the next slide. The influences of key variables affecting accident progression were evaluated for each plant group. For some variables, such as cesium inventory, seismic hazard exceedance frequency, population and economic statistics, these values were known or could be calculated with reasonable confidence. For other variables, conservative values were selected. Since the phase one work was intended to be a screening analysis, the conservative approach was justified because it eliminated the need for detailed analyses of all sites and spent fuel pool designs. The initiating event frequency were selected to be conservatively high to maximize calculated benefits. Liner fragilities, that is, uh, failure of the spent fuel pool liner, were uh, were conservatively selected based on previous analyses of the response of representative spent fuel pools to seismic events and cast drops. The spent fuel pool showed that for the reference boiling water reactor Mark I plant, any leakage would occur along the bottom edge of the pool. Therefore, for the initiating seismic event analyzed in the spent fuel pool study, the boiling water reactors with elevator pools were assumed to have ineffective air cooling only 80% of the time. For all other initiators for the boiling water reactor pools and all initiators for other pool configuration, I assumed air cooling would be ineffective. This assumption bounds the possible effects of partial drain down, blockage, closed cell racks, and non-dispersed fuel configurations, simply because I assumed if you lost water, the fuel could not be cooled. Mitigation can prevent a release from fuel that has been uncovered and its success is not affected by the storage density. Implementation of post-Fukushima orders for mitigating strategies and spent fuel pool instrumentation are expected to further enhance the capability to mitigate spent fuel pool events successfully. Nevertheless, 
in this analysis used a conservative assumption that mitigation would be effective and would substantially decrease the likelihood of radioactive or radionuclide releases for only the low density alternative. And it was conservatively assumed mitigation would not be successful for the high density alternative or the regulatory baseline. In this manner, I biased the results to favor regulatory action of expediting fuel transfer to dry casts. As stated previously, the analysis used representative fuel inventories for the two alternative loading conditions with conservatively high release fractions for the high density loading alternative and low release fractions from the spent fuel pool study for the low density loading configuration. Uh, next slide, please. The safety goal screening evaluation demonstrated that the NRC safety goal policy and quantitative health objectives are met with orders of magnitude margin for both current high density spent fuel pool loadings and proposed low density fuel loadings. Based on these results, the staff concluded that there is insufficient safety benefit to justify expedited transfer of spent fuel from U.S. pools to dry cast storage. Furthermore, the supplementary regulatory analysis to evaluate the cost-benefit merits of expedited transfer of spent fuel to dry cast storage shows that for the base cases evaluated, the benefits of expedited transfer are far less than the cost of implementation. These base case analyses are adequately conservative and support the staff's recommendation that more detailed evaluations of the benefits of expedited transfer of spent fuel need not be pursued. Slide 20, please. The staff had several public meetings and received comments related to the spent fuel pool study and the regulatory analyses and included the staff's responses and appendices to those documents. One of the principal uh, comments had to do with security. The staff determined that security issues have been thoroughly evaluated and appropriately and appropriate regulatory changes have been implemented. In response to the September 11, 2001 events, the NRC undertook security assessments of spent fuel storage and pools, and the NRC issued an order that required reactor licensees to develop and implement guidance and strategies, intended in part to maintain or restore spent fuel pool cooling capabilities following certain beyond design basis events. Furthermore, following the Fukushima accident, the NRC issued orders to improve severe accident mitigation capability and spent fuel pool water level instrumentation at U.S. nuclear power plants to further reduce core damage risk and spent fuel pool accident risk from beyond design basis external events. In this tier three analysis, the staff compared the calculated health risk from spent fuel pools to the quantitative health objectives and concluded that substantial safety enhancement is not achieved by expediting spent fuel transfer to dry storage. Even if the analysis were to demonstrate that the benefits for an alternative outweighed its costs, the regulatory action may not be justified based on the safety goal screening evaluation. The slow accident progression of a spent fuel pool fire, if one should occur, suggests a high confidence of evacuating the public. Coupled with the low probability of an accident, this reduces the estimated public health risk to substantially less than the quantitative health objectives, even if reducing that risk further can be shown to be potentially cost effective. The ACRS commented in their December 18th letter to the Commission that the staff was too conservative by assuming that mitigation would not be successful for the high density storage alternative. We recognize that mitigation would likely be effective for both loading configurations. However, in performing the screening evaluation, I assume mitigation would only be effective for the low density loading configuration to bias the results in favor of further study. While engaging both internal and external stakeholders, comments were raised that other alternatives should be analyzed, such as more favorable loading patterns. 
Although these alternatives may provide benefits near that of the low density storage alternative, they were not evaluated because the safety goal screening evaluation was not met. This completes my presentation, and I'll turn it back to, over to Mike. Thank you, Fred. And for the last slide in conclusion, uh, we end where we began uh, with the points. Uh, the current spent fuel pools provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection of public safety. That expedited transfer of spent fuel uh, would provide only minor or limited safety benefit. That the cost of expedited transfer of spent fuel to dry cast storage outweigh the benefits. And that additional studies are not needed. Um, we talked about in the presentation the fact that additional studies would remove simplifying conservatisms and reduce the state of benefit, uh, therefore further bolstering, I think, the conclusion of the staff. More importantly, we think additional work on this Tier 3 item would take away focus from more significant endeavors, like endeavors related to mitigating strategies and implementation of that order, the flooding reanalysis, for example, seismic reanalyses and upgrades needed at the plant, uh, and work, for example, on the National Fire Protection Association 805 performance-based standard for fire protection, all important safety issues currently uh, on, on, ongoing on the part of the staff and being implemented by the industry. That concludes the staff's presentation. We stand ready for your questions. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Let's start with uh, Commissioner Savinicki. Well, thank you all for your presentations and for the work uh, that's gone into uh, the topic that we're discussing, discussing today, which, again, in the interest of time, I know we can only talk about it at a rather high level. Um, on that point, I'm going to ask a question. Were all of you present in the room for the uh, first panel that spoke earlier? You're all nodding your heads in the affirmative. Was there anything that you heard either in the presentations of the first panel or in response uh, in the back and forth in the uh, question and answer period? Was there anything that you were surprised by or feel that you would like to take a moment to address if it was not addressed in your uh, remarks that you prepared in advance? Is there anything you'd like to, to clarify? And I should note for you that um, the staff conducted uh, and received comment on the study, and I have had the opportunity to review the staff's response to comments received, which was very extensive and is not something that you could discuss here today. So I know that the staff is, um, I, I will acknowledge the staff is likely not in agreement with everything they heard on the first panel. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking if having heard the Q&A and the presentations, there's anything that is omitted from, from the uh, formal remarks that you just gave that you'd like to address or clarify? No. Okay. Um, and again, I would um, commend to my uh, colleagues if they haven't had a chance to do it. It's a complex issue. There's a strong diversity of opinion on a number of points. I, I personally have read a lot of staff comment response documents, and at times the agency, I acknowledge, can be rather summary in its dismissal of comments. I would contrast, I feel, in this case, although there were references to earlier answers for the point of conciseness, I felt that the comment response provided by the staff uh, was very understandable. Again acknowledging that uh, not everyone is going to agree with the staff's response to the comments that they've submitted. Um, so uh, along that point, um, the chairman had asked uh, in the previous panel, she asked Mr. Heacock for some information uh, on current uh, practices in, uh, for, for outages, pool configurations, and, and how they go about configuring spent fuel pools. How would you characterize, in, in the absence of kind of a detailed licensee by licensee or station by station discussion, how would you characterize what you believe to be the staff's state of knowledge of current industry practices? Thanks. Well, um, there are, uh, after the September 11th events and when we did take a look in more detail at uh, spent fuel pool behavior, uh, we, um, I would say directed, that's probably too strong a word. I'll just say that ultimately changes were made in, in the licensing bases of the licensees about the loading of the spent fuel pools. And by a certain period of time, they go into a one by four pattern. And again, uh, it was alluded to that uh, we cannot say exactly uh, when that is in, due to the security um, 
implications, but uh, the, the analyses that were done by the spent fuel pools, in the spent fuel pool studied by the officer research, uh, makes um, um, what they've assumed in there is, is pretty, pretty accurate with, re with regard to the state of, of, of the spent fuel pool loading in the pools. And those, these loading, were, uh, these loading uh, patterns are part of licensing conditions in their actual licensing bases now. And of course the regions um, in their inspection procedures do check up on that. And just to, to add a finer point, maybe uh, even it is an area of uh, active oversight. Smith Fuel Pools receive active oversight. Uh, as Jennifer indicated, by our regions, it, uh, we continually watch operating experience. We've talked about that operating experience and, and factored it uh, into the work that was done today. So um, certainly uh, we are actively engaged in making sure that, that uh, our presumptions regarding safety of Smith Fuel Pools are well-founded. So, um, and the chairman had made a comment. She said, you know, we shouldn't just sit here guessing, and I'm in full agreement with that. So are you responding to me by saying that you're not just sitting there guessing and that in terms of your recommendation or the recommendation in the ComSecchi that this area does, is not justified for regulatory action, do you feel there's any elements of guessing in your recommendation? No, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Paxlokas. Thank you. Uh, the fact that uh, the uh, safety goal screening shows that these are of low risk uh, situations is used extensively and in fact on slide 20 you say that you did not consider other alternatives because they do not pass the safety goal screening criteria. Now, if we go back to the Federal Register notice dated September 20, 1985, where the rule is issued, there is a paragraph where the Commission explains what a substantial increase in the overall protection of public health and safety uh, means. And uh, you can compare that to the quantitative health objectives. But then it has a very interesting sentence. On the other hand, the standard is not intended to be interpreted in a manner that would result in disapprovals of worthwhile safety or security improvements having costs that are justified in view of the increased protection that would be provided. So this tells me that Comparing with the QHOs is not absolute. Okay? There may be other things that are cost beneficial that even though the risk is lower than the QHO, maybe we should do them. So how does that justify not looking at other alternatives, which you say on 20 they are rejected because they don't pass a safety goal screening. The uh, purpose of the uh, reg analysis that I performed was primarily to look at the uh, expedited movement of fuel, the five-year issue, uh, perform the uh, safety goal screen, demonstrated that it didn't meet that criteria, but recognizing that there is some judgment involved went forward with the cost-benefit analysis to provide even additional information with regard to whether a cost-beneficial determination could be made. With regard to other alternatives, uh, I uh, simply did not uh, perform additional analyses for other alternatives because uh, predominantly I was looking at the, the one issue. But there is a very strong statement in the regulatory analysis that basically says you know, the risks are low. We, if you use the QHOs, you're not going to find any substantial safety increase. But because we're a nice guys, we're going to look at cost-benefit. And I think that's very strong compared to what the Federal Register notice says. Should you be doing this because you're nice guys or because it says 
that alternatives should be considered even if they don't pass the screening criteria. Now, what alternatives could those be? Could it be a, a different pattern in the uh, pool which was not evaluated, like the one by eight? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the staff's position is that we don't need uh, additional studies. Would that be an additional study then, maybe? I think there is also another statement in the documents I have, I don't remember where, that says that uh, the Commission will encourage plants to consider these alternatives. I don't know how the Commission encourages anybody. Uh, but uh, are these the configurations you're talking, the patterns you're referring to, that maybe one by eight is uh, beneficial and will encourage the licensees to do it? But we are, have not done the analysis. Now, if we did the analysis and they turned out to be cost beneficial, then we should not encourage, we should direct. Correct? Well, I Am I going too far ahead? No, no, you're just, let us, let us respond to your question. We of course. Can, yeah. With regard to the, uh, the safety goal screen, that typically is a proxy for determining whether you can perform a backfit for a plant-specific uh, analysis. Because it didn't pass that screen, uh, uh, there's a likelihood that we would not pass the, the backfit criterion of 10 CFR uh, 109. 5109. Um, so you have uh, we have that reason plus because the uh, the uh, the expedited movement of fuel would most likely have a higher benefit than the one by eight, and that didn't pass. Uh, there's again the the lower likelihood that uh, other alternatives would uh, would pass that screen. The cost would be higher too. The cost for a one by eight may be lower, but it wasn't evaluated. Would it, should it be evaluated? Well, I can add um, in pointing to research that in the spent fuel pool study, they did calculate the one by eight uh, because that was what the Peach Bottom plant, uh, which was the reference plant, uh, went into loading patterns of, and it did show that it it it. it marginally reduced the probability of zirconium fire and, and large release. Um, but, but still, in any case, uh, in the case of either the low density or the high density, the first two months is the period um, that is of, of paramount importance in terms of uh, zirconium fire um, and, and large release probabilities. And the mitigating actions orders that we have implemented and the licensees will have implemented by 2016 call for um, more measures uh, to be brought to bear in the case of uh, a drain down event in the spent fuel pool and that likely is going to uh, take care of that um, that two month time period. But if that's the case and the argument is based on the scoping study why do I find a, stain, a statement somewhere else that the agency will encourage the licensees to do that. Commissioner, can I just try to um, add to what Jennifer said? So remember, again, we were we were looking in terms of whether or not uh, whether or not we should continue to phase two and phase three, and so we were using our processes to help us understand substantial uh, benefit uh, and cost justified. Um, and we came across these additional insights, this insight uh, regarding high density storage one by eight, which was uh, for me a, a new insight, uh, very, very insightful. Um, but remember, uh, and what our position is, is that when you look at that benefit, if you were gonna take it to its extreme in terms of looking at what 5109 requires in terms of being able to put that in place as a requirement, that benefit uh, given, again, the low likelihood that we're talking about, given what you would run up against when you would go to use the screening criteria, you would not be able to, we're projecting that you would not get to the point with respect to one by eight that the agency would be able to require, add that requirement. That's, that's just our, without doing the analysis, based on the work that we've done, we don't believe that the commission would be able to require that. That's, but, that's all we're trying but to do. But the rule doesn't say 
that you should apply the screening criteria all the time. It says, you know, on the other hand, the infamous on the other hand. Now, I, I don't know if you, uh, you, you keep talking about the phase two, and I, I suspect that's a lot of work. I would sure like to see a written statement, maybe summarizing what you said here, why going to a different pattern is not cost beneficial. You don't have to well, do new research, but maybe pull together all the arguments. Well, we would, do, we would have to do that before we would propose the requirement. That's what you're suggesting, is that we would do that additional work and look at a one by eight. I don't know if it's additional work. It's additional in some sense. But I mean, basically, you seem to have your, your arguments already. If I could see a s set of bullets, why go into a different pattern? Or maybe any of the other alternatives that Mr. Schoffer mentioned that were not analyzed. OK. Assuming that the argument that the screening is not necessary, the QHO screening not necessary, why shouldn't I do that? I'm not asking for a major treatise. I mean, you know, something, a summary. Understand. Well, not a paragraph, Jennifer. I mean, <laughs> a set of bullets, a set of bullets. We can concisely indicate why we feel that that's not and necessary I never to go to the that net. you can concisely articulate <coughs> your point. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Commissioner Magwood. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think Commissioner Poslox has beat the horse to death, but I'm going to resurrect it just a little bit because um, I, I did ask um, the industry uh, portion of this morning's panel to um, uh, what the plan was for the one by eight, and it is pretty clear that there really isn't a particular industry focus to do anything with one by eight at this point, although. Mr. Eacock did indicate there's some other things being looked at that they couldn't go into. Um, so as we encourage industry to, to look at the one by eight, uh, again, I don't, I don't I agree with Commissioner Postlock, I don't know what that means exactly. Um, I, I'd like to get, you want to give me an infinite time? I, I'm willing to take it. But I, um, I'll talk all day if you let me. But, um, but it seems to me that, um, you know, that there, there was a clear benefit that you found uh, to the one by eight one configuration. And, I, and, and to say, to dismiss it, to say that it wouldn't make the cut is something that I, I think it's difficult to, to really conclude that because the cost might actually be very minor if it's implemented over a long period of time. It, it, it may be very little cost. We don't know. We haven't analyzed it. Um, what what it, help me out a little bit more? What's what's the rationale for not pursuing this in some regulatory fashion? Uh, it, it goes back to the uh, concept of is it enough of a safety benefit to warrant uh, regulatory action? And we do have what we have the regulatory analysis guidelines points to the QHOs. But if we were to go to a particular plant and say you must now always go into a one by eight, we have to pass the back fit rule 5109 that has very specific um, uh, criteria. And in the safety benefit just isn't there because the safety benefit we know would be less than that is a achievable by going to uh, the low density storage. So in the case of the backfit criteria, which would be the, um, the appropriate regulation um, that governs the situation, after when the first thing in the backfit criteria, if it's not for adequate protection and it's not for um, um, compliance, then we go to a safety significance determination, if we don't make that safety significance determination, um, then regardless of the cost, we, we don't go forward. Now, if we do pass that, that safety significance benefit, then of course we then look at the cost benefit. Now, of course, the commission is always able to disregard 5109 if right. so you choose. Um, but just looking at a hand-waving argument, um, it, it's to us intuitively obvious that we wouldn't get that safety benefit. So, so the safety benefit of the one by four configuration, which... One by, oh, sorry, the one going to the one by eight instead of the one by four. No, the one by four we're in right now. Oh, one by four, yes. Um, that yes. kind of analysis was not done because it was done on an adequate yes. protection basis. Yes. Correct. And then I would add, if we were to go and develop 
a paragraph or two or three as necessary. Um, in this case, we would, of course, have to look at all other regulatory requirements in the fact that we have uh, the spend fuel pool level instrumentation order that is a requirement and also the enhanced mitigation <coughs> strategies that has much more equipment capacity there for sprays and, and um, that we would see that that is actually going to cut the probability of having a, an off-site release even further by far. So we just at this stage wouldn't be, since we're already at less than 1% of the QHOs, we just don't expect to get there. I mean, it does, it does for me, it, it raises the, uh, the thought that when we ordered the 1 by 4 configuration be implemented, um, we didn't have the knowledge that the 1 by 8 provided these extra benefits. I mean, you may very well have said go to 1 by 8 uh, after, after, the, after implementing the B5B um, if you don't this at that time. And it would have had greater benefit, correct? All right, I'll have to struggle with this a while longer, apparently. Um, let me ask you a question about the, about the QHOs and, and also the use of Melcor um, in analyzing uh, spent fuel pools. Um, there, I think you, you and your concerned scientists raised a lot of concerns about this. You had uh, some knock concurrences that raised issues, and I thought the knock concurrences raised some pretty um, good good issues um, that, um, and I read the, the, the management responses. But um, part of how I read where we are with the use of the QHOs and use of Melcor and a lot of the other tools you use, uh, and maybe I should direct this more at Brian, it's really because they're the tools that we have uh, there are the methodologies we have available um, as opposed to being the ideal tools and methodologies. You're shaking your head. Do you, you find... Just I'll point, start from NLR's perspective. NLR has great confidence in the MELCOR's uh, capability to model this scenario. And I'll point to Brian to fill that in with regard to the test programs. Yeah, I, th I mean, we looked at it, and I think Melcor, uh, if we had any doubts about its capabilities, uh, you know, we certainly would have identified those and uh, uh, addressed them as part of an uncertainty. Uh, but I think that, you know, our conclusion was based on the validation that we've done, uh, particularly with some of the tests we've been running out of Sandia with the uh, spent fuel pool, the uncovering, and looking at the uh, time to ignition and the like, uh, we had a lot of confidence. In the analysis. And use the Melcor for that application. Yes. Okay. What about the QHOs? Is that the right measure to use for spent fuel pools? I mean, Let me rephrase the question. Is, okay. it, <laughs> is it the is it is it the is it the, the measure you use if you had the time and resources to have other measures? Well, I mean, we have the agency, again, has a long history of considering this because we have been looking at spent fuel pool safety for, you know, decades now, 30 years. Um, it, it does, in the case of, of the QHOs, they focus on public health and safety directly. So um, it's one measure, but then again, in the cost-benefit analyses, we consider economic consequences. So already there is a balance between uh, the economic consequences and the public health and safety impact. So the QHOs has some information, and we provided you additional information through the cost-benefit, and, and we show that, again, we're not um, um, cost beneficial in the base cases and even with some um, um, high estimates. Okay. So it's, uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a balance. Is the right one? Um, we are, we have, a, we have a paper in front of the commission on economic consequences and it directed, the uh, SRM directed the staff to, to take a look at um, economic consequences and we're in the process of doing that now if we come up with something that is more appropriate Maybe we will. I, at this stage, don't know. But um, it is what we have, and we followed that, although we tried to provide the commission with as much information as we could, looking at that economic consequence piece in the reg analysis. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, one last question. We, we had a conversation in the previous panel about um, the reactor severe accident and spent fuel pool accident linkages. And um, in the... Uh, Dr. Thompson's presentation, he had this very large radiation field postulated that would prevent the use of mitigative uh, measures at, uh, to refill a spent fuel pool. 
Um, is this something that the staff has, I don't know if you, I haven't seen any scenarios lead to the kind of radiation fields he was, he was quoting, but how, what's, what's the staff's view of the linkage of react severe accident, a reactor severe accident and spent fuel pool um, mitigation? Well, I mean, regarding mitigation, we did analyze unmitigated scenarios precisely because we assumed, and even in the reg analysis, they assumed for the high density cases that it was all unmitigated. So part of the reason for doing unmitigated was because, you know, if something happened at the reactor, that was part of the motivation for, for right. doing unmitigated. I'm actually less interested in, in how it affected the study and more how we would, as a practical matter, uh, plan for the possibility of dealing with that scenario. So I'm, I'm actually more operationally and from a regulatory standpoint, how do we think about that? We, we do have this level three PRA that's going to be looking at this issue of uh, spent fuel pool and, rea and, and the reactor, you know, in more details. And so this is in SECI 11 9 and the staff is already doing the, uh, the analysis for spent fuel pool. But in case of the spent fuel pool study, uh, we, we did consider, you know, the reactor uh, accident. You know, either, either it was during the uh, uh, the outage where, you know, the reactor and the spent fuel were connected, hydraulic connected. So we did consider the decay heat of the reactor in that analysis, and also we did some sensitivity to see, you know, if if if, if a hydrogen uh, explosion was occurred as a result of the, uh, uh, you know, what happened in the reactor, what would happen. So these are all documented, you know. So we, we so these re these range of release fractions that we eventually use covers some of those reactor initiated events. Mike, did you want to add something? Yeah, and I think I think I don't necessarily I'm going to add to what Hossein provided, but I think I take comfort in the action that the commission's already taken with respect to the mitigating strategies order that says that plants have to have mitigating strategies in place uh, implemented to provide to maintain and restore core cooling, containment, and uh, spent fuel cooling. I take confidence, added confidence in those actions because those actions look at a beyond design basis external event and require that licensees for those for for the suite of concerns provide protection. Um, so that's that's why I think uh, that the commission and its action, um, even though again we didn't consider it in this analysis, went a great ways towards addressing that whatever that residual risk would be. Okay. Right. Uh, I was just going to add that. Um, you know, if you look at slide 11, it shows that the uh, there was a, a case where mitigation was not credited, and that would, I think, bound that scenario where you say, okay, uh, I can't access the pool because of a high radiation field, and where it came from may be, you know, uh, debatable, but whether it's from the reactor or just from the pool itself, um, the assumption was is that one could not get the mitigation features, you know, working. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Osendorf. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for your presentations. I wanted to commend the staff, and I'll direct this to Mike, uh, for the high quality of the SECI paper presented to us on this topic. I found it very well done. Uh, I think it's also very intellectually honest in saying, here's things we considered, here's things we didn't consider. So I think the assumptions and the parameters that framed your approach were very well laid out, and I wanted to thank you for that work. Brian, I wanted to start out with a comment that you made uh, in your part of the presentation about uh, the Commission receiving lots of letters and lots of public interest. I remember discussions we had back in April and May and June of 2011 on this topic. Um, and I think we all acknowledge that at the time of Fukushima and the days afterward, there's a certain amount of fog of war associated with level and spent fuel pools and questions as to the robustness or lack thereof. I know this, the SECI paper talks about the 20-plus uh, pools that have been subjected to an earthquake condition. From a qualitative statement, is it fair to say that now, almost three years after Fukushima, we have some qualitative sense that spent fuel pools are more, more robust than we perhaps thought in March of 2011? Uh, I I would say we have more quantitative evidence based on the analyses that we've done. Uh, I think based even on previous studies prior to Fukushima, um, most of those uh, concluded uh, that the probability of a, uh, you know, a release from a pool was, was very low. I remember Newreg 
1738, which we were doing uh, just prior to 9-11. Um, that was the conclusion that it was the probability was below the safety goals. Uh, uh, but I think the analyses, particularly like the structural analyses that we've done, that actually showed where we think the failure would occur, uh, you know, and how big it would be and what size earthquake it would actually take, um, you know, uh, really helped quantify our understanding. Okay. Thank you. I think this next question is probably for Hussein or Josie. Uh, if somebody else, please direct it. This is really kind of a question for clarification. I think the uh, mitigating strategies order requirements and the spent fuel pool level instrumentation order that went out uh, in the spring of 2012, when you were looking at the mitigation uh, case for these scenarios, is it my understanding that the mitigation understood was not assuming that flex had been implemented? Is that correct? No, we did not consider flex equipment, but we did make an assumption, as was said earlier, that, you know, that uh, the mitigation, if it's successful, it would be uh, available during the 72 hour. But I just want to mention that which is important is that we did scenarios with and without mitigation. We did not quantify if mitigation yep. But the mitigation scenario did not take into account some additional initiatives and requirements that we required in the mitigating strategies. Order. Is that correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I, Fred, will, uh, uh, this is part of your presentation. I commend you and your team for performing the cost-benefit analyses, even though the QHO screening criteria were not met. I found that very helpful. I think we would have been less significantly less well informed if you've not done that. Thank you. I did want to ask two questions. Uh, and I believe both these went back to Dr. Lyman on the first panel, and I wanted to see if you had any comments on these. Uh, one of these dealt with uh, Dr. Lyman's statement about uh, we really didn't update the economic consequences piece, and I, was, I understand that the you did a sensitivity analysis that included the $4,000 per rim avoided figure as part of that sensitivity, even though that's not yet been acted upon by the commission. Can you talk a little bit more about how that was looked at and what the results were of that sensitivity analysis? Uh, sure. Um, with re a little background with regard to the uh, uh, dollar per person rim conversion factor. Uh, this is something that uh, we have uh, studied for uh, the last couple of years. We're looking to uh, 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 develop a new reg and have that uh, provided to the commission as well as out for public comment. Because this work was in progress and it looked like the, uh, the value would go up to, say, a, a, so between four and five thousand dollars per person rem, uh, based upon uh, the value of statistical life used by other federal agencies, as well as an update to uh, uh, one of the other factors. Uh, I included that in the analysis just to inform, just in case it did go forward with that regard. However, I also did it using the current value just so that uh, we understood the sensitivity. In general, it increased the uh, averted doses by a factor of two. Uh, what was your other question? I didn't ask it yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Lyman did raise a concern on the lack of an uncertainty analysis approach in some aspects, and I didn't know if you had any, you or any other team members had any comments on that. Well, I attempted to address those uncertainties by using conservative values. I developed a base case that generally used conservative values that uh, addressed the uh, uh, the pools that were in each of the spent fuel pool groupings. I also did sensitivities that varied single parameters so that you could see the impact of any one parameter might have on the answers. I also uh, did a set of sensitivity evaluations that took all low values grouped together as well as all high estimate values grouped together to show the possible range. Um, 
when that was presented to the ACRS, for instance, uh, they commented that the you know, those high sensitivities were uh, extravagantly uh, way too high and way too conservative, and that the base case was a, a good reflection of of uh, the proper analysis. Appropriate analysis. I guess just uh, I said another way. I think when we dealt with uncertainties, our the, the way in which we tried to approach those was to bound them with conservatism <coughs> in the analysis, uh, to to treat them in that way. Um, that's what that's how we handled them. If I could just add one point, the uh, for instance, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion in the earlier panel with regard to uh, uh, partial drain down, uh, coolability. Uh, and those were really handled by doing a bounding uh, value, that is, assuming that the fuel would not be coolable at all if you lost water inventory. Therefore, the partial drain down situation was addressed. The closed uh, racks were addressed. So by doing that, I fundamentally you know, took that uncertainty away by bounding it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um just a quick question to start off, because there's been discussion about mitigation. In your view, were the operators at Fukushima able to adequately use mitigation for Unit 4's pool? I'm just curious. Was that successful mitigation or not? Well, I, it's hard to tell. We. Um, uh, Early on, we weren't quite clear, wasn't clear what they, they were doing. Um, after the hydrogen um, um, explosion, then they started uh, the helicopters dumping water, and, and they don't believe that that was successful. Uh, the difference between, I would say, the United States plants and, um, and, and the Japanese plants is that they did not have portable equipment available, and it took them quite a long time. Portable equipment like? Uh... E5B. HH, 5054 HH. Right, equipment. okay. So um, in, in our case, the mitigation that we discussed in, in the study is more focused on the, the 5054 HH equipment. Um, so that wasn't available to them. And in fact, um, Daini um, had quite extensive damage, but uh, the corporate TEPCO was able to provide them um, 16 kilometers, I believe, of electrical cable that allowed them to string um, power from an off-site line in, and they didn't get that type of equipment to okay. Daiichi. So I think that's the real difference. Okay, thanks. Um, and just to uh, to go back to something Commissioner Savinicki said, I just want to clarify, uh, maybe I misunderstood in my discussions with staff, but are we aware of how much spent fuel is in each reactor's pool in the country? Do we have those numbers to hand? Do we have the numbers of the, the burn-up of the fuel to hand? Do we have the arrangements of the fuel in the pools to hand? Chairman, can I, can I ask, uh, in response to your question, can I ask Steve Jones to come uh, and, and tell you what we do have? Uh, good morning. Steve Jones, uh, Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. I guess what we have established in the licensing process is bounds for operation. I, I know. I know we have a, I understand that we have a licensing basis for all of, for these things, but I'm just wondering whether we have to hand the actual numbers right now. My understanding was not. The, the exact number of fuel assemblies located in a specific pool at a specific yeah, time. Just, just would, say that the, the amount of spent fuel in a particular pool right now. Right, we would rely on resident inspectors to establish that information if we needed it for a particular pool at okay. a particular time. Thanks. Um, thank you. Okay, now to actual bigger questions. Uh, so, um, so in your paper on filtered vents, okay, which I very much appreciate. I thought it was a very thorough job. You guys examined the potential benefits of filtered vents to mitigate the risks of a reactor accident, right? And you pre presented a number of options with pros and cons um, and considered uh, accidents and backfit scenarios. You, know, you did a, a pretty broad study. You also considered a number of other policy factors, such as defense in depth, significant uncertainties, and estimating event frequencies, and economic consequences, the safety value of con controlling hydrogen, and the margins for emergency planning and protective actions. Okay, I thought it, you did a really fantastic, thorough job. But in this paper, 
you present one option in requiring a very rapid transfer of all fuel older than five years, not old, old fuel, but just fuel older than five years, in all plants to dry cast storage with a brief discussion of other options um, that you just say that they'll come to the same conclusions, <coughs> that other options would come to the same conclusion. So um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering and I'm, trying to, I'm struggling with how accidents from spent fuel pools and how the risks posed by spent fuel pools and the potential large consequences in the regulatory analysis are different than the regulatory analysis of filtered vents. So can you help me understand that discrepancy? I, I'm, you know, from, from my world, I like to make sure, you know, it's parallel construction. We, we do the same kind of analysis for everything, so. Sure, Chairman. Let me just start, and then as, I, as I'm talking, others can weigh in and help me. Um, so when we were looking at the, the, the recommendation for filtration, for example, or filtering strategies, remember, we were dealing with inadequate protection. We were dealing with whether the Commission should, as a part of adequate protection, require hardened vents to be severe accident capable, recognizing that if they use those vents, they, the result of that venting would be uh, potential contamination. And so we looked at that, um, offered those up for the Commission to support, um, you know, the Commission had decisions to make about how, what options would be taken, uh, mm -hmm. alternatives would be taken to knock down, if you will, that those radioactive materials that would be released as a result of the Commission action to, uh, for adequate protection, strengthen, make those vents uh, severe accident capable. In this instance, uh, again, as we've uh, tried to try to say, um, we had to, uh, ultimately, I'm going to step past where we were with respect to phase one, phase two, and phase three of this tier, tier three analysis to say, ultimately, for backfit, we've got to, if we're going to implement 5109, the commission can always decide not to, but if, for the staff, if we're going to pass that test, we've got to make sure, we've got to, setting aside adequate protection, and this is not adequate protection, we've got a, a two-part test, significant and cost justified. And so, and you again, have that we with filters at, too, right? Well, well, again, for, well, I think for filters, the situation was um, exactly. that we were we were making the vents severe accident capable as an adequate protection order. So the commission had already decided that the right, but whether the, the decision of whether to add a filter or not was was still right. going to so you still we still did that analysis. So there was right? an analysis around how to how that filtration might happen. Um, so I, I know that hasn't probably uh, answered Yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm struggling with why it's different. Yeah, following the, uh, the uh, Saki paper on, uh, that you're referring to, uh, we did get uh, direction with regard to how to address qualitative factors. Uh, which we owe you a paper on in the, um, you know, this year. But there have been no decisions made on that, correct? No, just uh, uh, a statement that, uh, you know, you'd like uh, more detail in terms of qualitative factors, which is similar to, uh, you know, how to address defense in depth and other considerations uh, within regulatory analyses, and how to incorporate uh, those qualitative, that qualitative information with the quantitative numbers to come to a recommendation. Um, as a result, uh, uh, I probably, uh, you know, used a lot more quantitative versus qualitative. There are quali qualitative elements that are identified as other considerations within the regulatory analyses, but I did not weigh them similar to how it was done in the uh, containment uh, filtering uh, uh, RA to factor that or bias the decision. <clears throat> and I know you I don't know if you're going to go for a second round, so I'll try to be brief. And that is, I mean, part of this is, um, I think, the staff's understanding of the spin fuel pool behavior because, of, you know, I counted there was over 10 studies that we've done on spent fuel pool safety, and, and a lot of them looked at the difference between high density and low density. So after Fukushima, and as Brian indicated with a lot of the, the public input, you know, we focused on, okay, getting all the fuel out of there to maximize any benefit 
it, getting all the fuel out of there that um, could be placed in dry casks according to the current designs of the casks. And so we got into that mode of thinking. Uh, the research had started the spent fuel pool study. We ended up adding it as a tier three item. And then during that, in, in, with the um, deliberations both publicly and internally, other options were suggested. And again, going to the one by eight, because actually we didn't recognize that would provide that much benefit. But Peach Bottom had already done going to one by eight. And so we had learned from the research work that that made a benefit. Um, and also enhancing uh, mitigation strategies, for instance. Um, and so um, we anyway, upon completing the calculations, we looked in and we said, well, this is, in our minds, going to um, removing all of the fuel that's sold in five years was not enough of a substantial or not a, not a substantial safety increase, and it didn't meet it didn't meet the, the safety goal. So doing anything that was even a subset of that was obviously not going to, in our minds, reach that that uh, level of safety required um, under the 5109 as opposed imposed on the staff. So we didn't go into great detail uh, and, and look at others, but we did sit down and think about it. Um, a number of people sat down and think about it, myself involved, um, and it, it we just, just feel like we didn't need to do that. We right, I mean, it, it sounds like there was, I appreciate your discussion about this qualitative factors thing, which I think we can have a whole seminar on ourselves. But. Um, so you've done a lot of you're saying you've done a lot of work before, and and you sort of decided that based on all that work you didn't really need to do much more. But I thought Brian's study was very interesting. That that this one by eight result was very interesting and important, and something that needs more exp exploration. Eric, you wanted to say something. Thank you, Eric Leeds, Director of the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. The short answer, I think, to your question, Chairman, for why the staff. Uh, recommended what it did with regard to adding filters for D BWR uh, Mark 1 and 2 containments was because the cost justification analysis was very close. Well, I, with I, regard I, to spent fuel pools, the cost benefit justification wasn't even close. Well, we it depends on the initial assumptions, right? I mean, that's what the non concurrence was about. In part, the initial uh, assumptions were very, very conservative, as the ACRS also stated. <clears throat> um, I have more questions, but let's go to round two here. Nothing? No, I don't. I know. <laughs> well, we've had uh, some interactions with the industry recently in another context, and they were making NEI, especially, a very strong argument that. Um, some of the guidance we're issuing for PRAs and uncertainties and so on, there's a lot of bells and whistles that are really not necessary for regulatory decision making. And now we come to this study, and instead of an uncertainty analysis, we have this high, medium, low, when the agency has regulatory guide 1.200, we have a very simplistic human reliability analysis when we have very sophisticated models. Is it time perhaps for us to go back and look at those guides and uh, new regs and say, wait a minute now, this is really way too much. Even we cannot implement them. That's, I think, a, a very serious question here because this other initiative we have, you know, to prioritize issues according to the, to the risk significance, this becomes a major impediment. So maybe we're overdoing it. Maybe we have a, a priesthood that develops the 1.200s, and then the practitioners who say, forget it, I mean, that's, that's please. Well, I'll say that we have uh, work underway as directed by the Commission to take a look at regulatory analyses and see across the agency how the different business lines, spent fuel, um, um, transportation and waste, materials, um, and, and reactors, operating reactors, new reactors, how regulatory analyses are performed and uh, we're doing a bit of a gap analysis to determine best practices across the, the business lines and we will be coming forward to the Commission 
commission in the next, I believe, six months or so uh, with the results of that to recommend any changes to how we're doing things. But but the, the new Reg BR brochure 0058 has been around for quite a long time, has had s uh, several different um, um, public interactions about establishing that. The high, medium, and low is defined in, in the new Reg BR, so we're following a pretty well-established program and it, it's it's really not complicated what gets complicated is everybody agreeing on on the parameter values but you are referring to the regulatory analysis my question was broader we keep issuing those reports new regs regulatory guides that really go into a lot of detail how to do this analysis and uncertainty analysis and then we ourselves don't use them so there's something wrong with that we have to go back and think when we develop a, a regulatory guide 1.200, we shouldn't have the industry in mind. We should have our own staff. Can they actually implement it? Anyway, I, we are running out of time. So. Can I just, Commissioner, uh, just add, though, um, I sort of um, trying to weigh how I should respond to your question because I'm in great favor of uh, moving forward with the industry in terms of improving the PRA tools, for example, uh, in their application, as we've discussed. Um, but, I, but. I hope you heard from us that we didn't feel inhibited by our tools um, to be able to do this analysis. We were well supported by our tools to do this analysis. We made uh, we, we, we made conservative assumptions. We were bounding in instances where we felt appropriate because we wanted to get to the point where we would know uh, with certainty whether or not we would recommend for the commission continuing with, tier, with the remaining parts of the study. This is a long discussion, Mike. I don't want to engage you, but I think we have a staff member who wants to say something. Uh, Don Helton, Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research. I just want to uh, make it clear because of the, the context of your question. The decision early on here was to not do, that a probabilistic risk assessment was not needed in this particular case because they had been performed in the past on this subject. Uh, in cases where we are undertaking probabilistic risk assessments like the site level 3 PRA previously mentioned, these things are part of the playing field. So that justifies taking high values and putting them all together? No, 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 I disagree. Thank you. Commissioner Maglin? Okay. Uh, indulge me. Two questions. One question I asked the previous panel, I'll ask you guys too. So um, do we know about international experience, what other countries do, and why they've made the decisions that they have? I, I, yeah. Um, yeah, we, um, as part of our actions we have uh, with the Fukushima related actions, we have looked at the international practices and um, there are three countries that of course look at reprocessing so um, they they move their fuel um, a little more, um, mm -hmm. I would say, timely than say uh, what we do here in the United States and what the other countries do, um, but all the other countries are using high density storage and with, at this stage, no intention of, of doing otherwise for, from what we've heard, although we constantly interact with our international colleagues, so we'll be looking at that. <clears throat> okay. I'll look forward to some details on that, okay? It, you know, I, was, I was just going to add that the, uh, the CSNI, and I'm the chair of that committee, uh, uh, was planning on uh, doing a, a spent fuel study similar to what we've done. Uh, I've kind of encouraged them to hold off until we finished ours because they could probably piggyback on that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but they plan on doing a, a similar study uh, sometime in the future. Okay, it would be interesting to know because I just recalling uh, the last INRA meeting that I was at the International Nuclear Regulators Association where a number of folks reported on their practices and I know Canada has recently changed its practice so I would like to hear an update on that. Um, okay, and final question. So this slide that you guys showed a couple times, this tan, green, and purple one, um, this integrated analysis that you guys talked about today, um, how was this communicated to the public and, and when, and was the public able to comment on this overall approach? Yeah, I'll, let me start and then, um, and then others will help me. So with respect to the Tier 3 plan, uh, we, we started off with a plan, I originally communicated that with all the Tier 3 items, uh, and then revised that plan, and I don't have the specific... Yeah, but I'm talking about the specific... Um, 
you know, the, the two studies that we're reporting yes. on here today. And, and, and in that revised plan, we talked about how we would build on, how we would, what the relationship between the spent fuel study, pool study, and how we would broaden that to a generic regulatory analysis. So that was the first written communication about that three uh, uh, phase process and how we were going to move from, again, the, the pool study to this overall uh, decision with respect to moving forward on the tier three, the tier, uh, three item. Um, we then had, uh, as, as you know, uh, uh, two public meetings, one in uh, August uh, and then uh, another meeting in September. Uh, I uh, didn't uh, go to the August meeting, went to the September meeting where we talked about issues uh, regarding the analysis. And in addition to that, um, as you saw, um, not again about the overall approach, but in terms right. of the so details there was no, of the Right, so there was study. no opportunity for the public to comment on the overall approach, did you want? During the August meeting, I went through that in great detail, and uh, there were a number of uh, comments come back saying how much detail I went into. <laughs> that was... Okay, but I think the August meeting was presented as a uh, meeting on the spent fuel pool study, your study, uh, even though it was really about your study. And your study was not available to the public, only your study was, so that was a bit of a miscommunication. What it was was to describe how uh, the study was going to be performed. So it went through the, uh, the methods that uh, I used to perform the analysis. So they did have that information available. Okay. Any other comments? Jennifer? Well, I would just say, too, that um, the, the work that the re research organization did, we had thought about um, the need for public comment um, in, in the Office of um, Nuclear Reactor Regulation. And uh, because the spent fuel pool study went out for public comment and written comment, um, and really the guts of, of or the real technical details uh, were in that study, uh, we believe that public meetings, having a dialogue would, um, you know, back and forth would be more beneficial than and actually going out for any kind of public comment, as did the, uh, the research group with the study, their study. Okay. But we just had two meetings. And we had two meetings. Correct. One, one not And then, right. of course, we had and several ACRS meetings um, on both right. topics that were public. Yeah, I know. I know the ACRS meetings are always appreciated. Okay. Any other comments? Any final comments from the commission? No? All right. Well, thank you all. It was a very informative and thorough morning. I appreciate everybody bearing through the whole session, and we get to do it again in an hour. <laughs> so we are adjourned.